Willie Fritz's team last week was down 14 to 7 when Pratt came off the bench and went in at quarterback, and all they did was win the game 66 to 24. So he talked about the fact that you earn your right based on performance to get into this spot, and Michael Pratt certainly earned it last week. This has been the Nissan pregame rush. Houston will start with the football. Marquez Stevenson. He returned a couple of kicks last season for touchdowns. He'll watch this one go. And so here comes Clayton Toon. And a Houston offense that has been, as we said, chomping at the bit to get on the field last season. De'Ara King, the surprise red shirt. He decides to then leave and end up in Miami. So Clayton Toon takes over for De'Ara King last season. 2019 turned out to be a year where he would end up starting seven games. He's got 19 touchdowns against 11 interceptions in 12 career games. And he'll start from his own 25-yard line. And the air raid goes up top on first down. Drops it in down the sideline. And it looks like they will credit Speedy Stevenson with the catch. And a quick first down for the Cougars. You'd imagine seeing a lot of this early and often. Great job out front sorting out the twist and then give your best player a chance in space going up against a safety. Chase Kirshen on that one. That's a matchup Tulane may not want to go back to. They waste no time. Keith Corbin, he picks up about three and a half. And Bob, you see the tempo already from Houston's offense. This is something I was curious about coming off of that training camp hiatus, that 53-day extended training camp. Are they going to have their legs under them enough to go into this now seeing game speed for the first time? Tune out of the pocket, and he'll throw this one away. You wonder how aggressive Tulane will be tonight, bringing pressure. Are they just going to count on their front four to try and get after Toon, or are they going to have to dial up some pressure looks as well? Listen, we know Dana Holgerson's version of the air raid is a little different, but what did we see recently if you're majoring in man coverage versus an air raid offense, LSU and Mississippi State? Things tend not to go well, so you'd like for Patrick Johnson, number seven, you saw with that pressure, Cameron Sample, number five, the other time, other side to be able to get after the quarterback with that four down rush here on third and six. The two defensive ends for the green wave are going to have to have big nights, you would think, as now a timeout will be called from the sideline by Dana Holgerson. Timeout, Houston, third first of the half. 30 seconds in lead. Let's take a look at our impact players. Clayton Toon, the obvious one, and you saw right off the bat, Marquez Stevenson, speedy. And a receiving core that Dana Holgerson said was the fastest he's ever coached. They bring back their top four wideouts, and then those DNs, outside linebacker bodies for Tulane. Stout, solid rushers that are really going to need to make an impact. This D-line for Tulane, averaging just over 10 tackles for loss per game so far this season. They're going to have to live in the backfield tonight if they want a chance. After the timeout, third down and six. And Tulane showing blitz. Play clock not nearly near zero, so that flinch may have cost five yards for Houston. Let's see. Tulane thought they spotted a false start. I'm not sure if the officials will agree. Reset the game clock. Okay. Looks 14. like we've got a timing error. And the clock was off by about two minutes. <laughs> Just a bit outside. <laughs> they try and run for it with Kyle Porter. And he won't get anywhere near the first down. So now an early decision for Houston to make. You'd have to think, though, you're running the ball maybe there on third down because you know you're going for it on fourth down. Made with fourth down in mind. And I'd imagine they go back to the ground right here. So an early fourth down 
as the Cougars will go for it. Here comes the blitz. Toon's in trouble, and he throws an interception. The pressure works to perfection. Macon Clark down the sideline. That's a pick six for the Green Wave to start. We wondered if Tulane was going to dial up some pressures and come after Clayton Toon. They just did, and it scores them a touchdown. Eric Lover adds the extra point, and it's 7-0 Tulane. The turnover beads come out, and with good reason, but make no mistake, this started up front. You see five up and then adding the extra blitzer in the middle, flushes Tune out for an ill-advised throw as he's being taken down. And just as we mentioned, getting pressure with four, Tulane not content to sit back. They go on the attack. Kevin Henry gets the pressure that makes it an easy house call for Megan Clark. Scott Free up the middle there, and that's the difficulty. You see those five players all mugged up near the line of the scrimmage for today, Tulane's defense. That Houston offensive line's got to make decision. They've got their eyes occupied there, and if the ball's not coming out quick, that blitzer's got a free hit. Quarterback's got to know that. Keith Corbin, the intended receiver, also came up with a bit of a limp, so we'll see if he is able to get back on the field. Because Houston, they'll be right back to the offense. Marcus Jones he is back deep to receive along with Stevenson. Didn't take long for the Green Wave to have to kick it off again. And it'll come right back out to the 25-yard line after their defense scores. Now, you don't play through the first five weeks of the season. Everybody else has games under their belt. How much of this communication-wise for an offensive line, diagnosing where pressure is coming from has to do with rust maybe where this opposition they've been playing for three or four weeks and this is your first game at absolutely all of that communication in real time with the crowd there's 10,000 people out here in the stands and against the D-line whose front four came into this season with 110 combined starts soon will have to have amnesia and he is able to find Keith Corbin so Corbin able to stay on the field as he came up a bit lame after he was the intended receiver on the Macon Clark pick to start off the scoring for Tulane. And so now you've got to do one of the toughest things in football, turn the page and get on to the next play as they go right back to tempo. Get him out of thinking. And they'll easily pick up the first down into the secondary goes Porter. And he's out to midfield. And this is the big difference. The Dana Holgerson air raid loves to get with it on the ground. You see a five-man box from the defense. And the running back's job, Kyle Porter, to make one miss in space. Tough open field tackling look for Kershaw. Four-man rush, two and well protected. Finds a crosser at Speedy Stevenson. Brought down after a gain of three. Like Nick Anderson was able to stay with him and make a nice open field tackle. He jogs off the field there, but when we asked Clayton Toon what he loves throwing, he said he loves throwing that deep post and he loves throwing it to five because it is impossible to overthrow that guy. He's going to come back and get under everything. Oh, the car finds a lane and a cutback alley. All the way down to about the two-lane 23-yard line before he's finally brought down. And a great job getting to this stretch zone. Watch number 85, the tight end, getting all the way up to the third level and getting just enough tracking on that zone play. Springing a big run to get them down near the red zone. Expect a shot going towards the end zone here now with plenty of space to work with for Clayton Toon.
to the end zone. It's a 50-50 ball. And Jeremy Singleton, the intended receiver, may have drawn a penalty on Jalen Monroe. And this is why you leave it a little bit underneath for your receiver. Let him try and come back to it. Toon sees Jalen Monroe's eyes straight into the chest of his offensive player. Bob, the minute you see that back turn as a quarterback, your eyes light up because you know you can turn it loose. Give your guy a shot at it. Best case, the touchdown. Worst case, you're working inside the 10. So first and goal. Houston trying to come back from the pick six to start. Two, quarterback run. Lowers his shoulders. Walk down at the five-yard line where it will be second down and goal. And again, as you look at air raid staples, that stick draw and using the quarterback's legs. They said Clayton Toon's a better athlete than he's gonna get credit for. And I think getting him involved early, especially going up the middle, this Houston team's gonna wanna try and take advantage of athletic mismatches in the middle of the field all night. Remind them that your quarterback is willing to take off. And I have a feeling some of those windows start to get a little wider. Now this offense should create some run friendly box counts, I would think for a quarterback to take off once in a while. This time he'll give it to Mulbacar and that's easy does it for the Cougars as Carr goes over from five yards out and Houston's on the board. And you mentioned, Bob, this offense getting some favorable box looks. How about a two-man backfield to give you an extra blocker at the point of attack? You see 22 getting up and getting involved, counter action from the line and a walk-in touchdown for Houston to even it up. So Mulba Carr gets the first touchdown of the season for the Cougars. And Dalton Witherspoon makes it a 7-7 game. Haven't even played four full minutes yet. Already fireworks on Thursday Night Football. ESPN College Football is presented by Capital One. What's in your wallet? Welcome back to Thursday Night College Football presented by Capital One. Bob Schusen, Mike Golick Jr., Chris Budden, 7-7 tie. A defensive score for Tulane, and then a terrific offensive answer for Houston. So we've barely played about four minutes. Mari Jones is back deep to receive the kick now, as will be sent deep by Baxa, and we'll get our first look at the true freshman quarterback, Michael Pratt, at least in tonight's game. He played extraordinarily well off the bench in a blowout win over Southern Miss last week, but tonight his first career start. And Mike, it does seem to be a little different, the weight on the shoulders, especially of a true freshman, when now you're not coming off the bench to do your best to dig a team out of a hole. Now this game is on you from the start. We're all looking to you. It's the difference when you know you're the guy going into the meeting rooms during the week, even the virtual ones that we've got in 2020. Being the man and having those eyes on you is something they feel pretty confident Pratt can shoulder the load of. Their offensive coordinator, Will Hall, said he has got boatloads of swag, as the kids say. You're a kid. It's a, as the kids say. <laughs> <laughs> quoting him, <laughs> quoting me, it all works. Yeah. I do feel more bald spot appropriate on this crew than I do with Dan Orlovsky usually. <laughs> it's a safe space, no There's doubt. Cameron Carroll using the stiff arm, and he's knocked out of bounds. That's a one-yard loss on first down. So just like that, got a true freshman quarterback on the road, prime time, national television, and you're behind the chains on the snack and snap of the night. Nice play action fake and a flip into the left flat to Tyrick James, the tight end. And he's about three yards shy of a first down, so it brings up an early third down for the Green Wave. And this is a Green Wave with a lot of confidence in their offensive line up front, led by Sincere Hainsworth, who Willie Fritz said, that's a power five center who just happens to be about six feet tall. Put it in the hands of your group up front. Tons of experience on that left side and tons of talented youth. A couple of true freshmen in Josh Remnitz and Trey Tuggle holding down the right. Four-man rush. Low throw, incomplete. 
Had a man open, but was not able to find Amari Jones, so it's a three and out for Tulane to start. We talked about the ends for Tulane, but you see Peyton Turner coming off the right side against one of those freshmen getting around at the end. Party at the quarterback there early on as they force a punt. And now this Houston offense that got into a little bit of rhythm, gonna get the ball in pretty decent field position here for their third drive. Ryan Wright will kick it to Marcus Jones. Jones retreating to the 15-yard line and goes down right there. So a field position flip for the Green Wave. A nice punt by Ryan Wright. That's what football means to me, just being able to live out my dream and be a role model back to the kids back at home. Brotherhood and unity and, and uh, opportunities for greatness. College football allows me to better myself as an individual and as a man on and off the field. It's an opportunity for me to change my life and, and do better out here. Football has allowed me to be a positive impact on other people's lives. Personally, I feel like it changed my life for the better. I think it has created and built massive character in my life and prepared me to be the man I am today. Bob Shoes and Mike Golick Jr., Chris Budden, and that cute little guy here on Thursday Night Football from Houston, the Green Wave and the Cougars tied at seven. And you know, Mike, so much effort, obviously, even on the part of the players, went into making sure that this college football season got played in some way, shape, or form. As trying to grind out a yard is Mo Bacar. What do you think it means to the players on the field, even playing in largely empty stadiums, to put these uniforms on and get some type of a college football season even if you're at Houston, you start tonight and you're only playing nine games this year. It's got to be a huge sigh of relief, especially over the summer where we all had a lot of days where we thought this wasn't going to happen and you had to have some of those thoughts entering your mind on multiple occasions, keeping each other up and accountable, finally paying off for you in the form of fall Thursdays and Saturdays. Clayton Toon lost the football. It might be another defensive touchdown. And it is for Tulane. Toon throws a pick six and now he coughs one up and it becomes a defensive score for Jeffrey Johnson. And don't look now, we're calling the same name on this pressure. Last time it was up the middle, this time it's coming off the right-hand side. An unbelievable job. Kevin Henry does it again, as he is a free runner on a blitz that created the pick six. And now he loops around and strips the ball away from Clayton Toon. Two defensive touchdowns for Tulane, and we have yet to play six minutes. The turnover beads. I hope they're fastened tightly over there because right now <laughs> they're coming out early and often for the big fella, Jeffrey Johnson. Fourteen seven Tulane. Tulane has run three plays on offense, a three and out. That's all they have to show for their offense so far tonight, and yet they've got 14 points on the board. An incredible job, and we talked about him last time. Kevin Henry, number 33 right here, creating free rush opportunities. And you see everyone going down. You create a one-on-one -on -one there on the outside, and he comes in with the Khalil Mack-like strip on the outside. This is what modern football has become, going with the edge of that quarterback. Patrick Johnson clearing out with the spin move there to create a free look for Kevin Henry that ends in a big boy touchdown. One of the most marvelous sights in all of sports, Bob. Drink it in. Oh. Well, Kevin Henry's a grad transfer from Oklahoma State. He's from Baton Rouge. So he just wanted to play football for one more season someplace where his family could come to all of the games, and then coronavirus hits. So hit the main reason that he's at Tulane, he was hoping there'd be fans in the stands and his family would be able to take the games in. And of course, a pandemic hits. Well, it still looks like it's worked out for him tonight because he's created 14 points for his team. Wherever they're watching, they are smiling right now. Seeing the job he's done early and the job Jack Curtis, their defensive coordinator, has done early, dialing up some pressures and getting free hitters on Clayton Toon. A 
another touchback. It will come out to the 25-yard line. Plenty of news and notes in the world, not only of college football, but also the NFL. And it all stems from the pandemic that we're currently in. Our prayers and thoughts go to Les Miles as the head coach at KU has tested positive for coronavirus. So hopefully he makes a speedy recovery. The Broncos and Patriots have moved from Sunday to Monday to allow for more recovery time and negative tests for the Patriots and all of the positive tests that have fallen with the Titans and Bills. Their game goes now from Sunday to Tuesday. Now the Bills were supposed to play the Chiefs on Thursday. That game now moves to the following Sunday. As Clayton Toon in trouble and he's going to go down again. So everyone, Mike, has to be nimble in the world of college football, in the world of pro football. Houston had five games at the start of their college season canceled, and now you've got teams bouncing games all over the schedule to try to get them all played in the midst of a pandemic. And we know the NFL had a lot less wiggle room. Think what the Big Ten is getting ready to deal with, and a lot of the conferences yet to return who don't have those bye weeks as open spots and open dates. That's a great point. Check down to Chandler Smith. Makes it third and manageable for the Cougars. And we've seen them have some success running outside early. You saw the two backs down by the goal line. But you're wondering if that stretch zone's another opportunity here for the long three. Diving catch made by Stevenson. Nope, they're going to say incomplete. So the fourth Houston possession in less than six minutes ends with a three and out. And it's been a choppy start that you might expect from a team and a great job by making Clark getting a fist in there and punching that football out on contact. But it's been rocking up and down right now. A team that had 53 days to prepare, that kept having to stop and go, hurry up and wait. Right now, the story of the first four offensive drives for Houston. Amari Jones gonna let this one go out of bounds up near the 40 yard line. So this should be excellent field position for the Green Wave with a seven point lead. Welcome back to Houston as we take a look at Hurricane Delta's path is expected to make landfall tomorrow. Tulane will get back home late this evening before it's expected to hit New Orleans. In case they do have any severe weather there, they have an off-campus hotel they can go to. We're starting to see some of those outer bands hit the Houston area. It's starting to get dark just within about the last 20 minutes and Bob a little bit of sprinkling on and off coming from those clouds 2020 I think is all we can say as it's back to the offense now for the green wave and jitterbugging to the outside as Amari Jones he picks up a couple of yards we have had so many name storms we are now into the Greek alphabet because we have run out of names and talk about an area of the country that is storm weary and does not need another rainstorm, much less a hurricane. As Michael Pratt checks one down. And that's caught by Jones, close to a first down. It'll be third down and one. And Amari Jones, a guy who's such a great special teams player, them fifth in the American in all-purpose yards last year. They want to get more touches and involvement in this offense because he's so versatile. Up tempo and a first down. Jones dives forward for about three. And Willie Fritz, well known for being one of the more analytically inclined coaches in college football. And we see now as you're across the 50, you're nearing four down territory from here on out. And Will Hall, their offensive coordinator, just needs to know that decision making process, how it's going to go around second down. So it allows him to have a better job and an easier time calling plays with the downs, distances, and the mentality they're going to take into each drive. Well, that time they went Wildcat, direct snap to Amari Jones, but he was shut down right at the line of scrimmage. And he's going to stay out there, give them some quarterback run options here. Remember, this is a team only two years removed from running triple option looks themselves. Direct snap again. They try the same play, basically the same result. Amari Jones grinds out just a couple of yards. 
Donovan Newton was waiting for him, a heart of that Houston defense. So now it's third down and eight. Third down and eight, and your quarterback, they moved the pocket to help him a bit last time. Think maybe go to that because, again, you're in four down territory in this area of the field. So all you need to do is get four yards here, three yards here, put yourself in a manageable fourth down situation that we know they're not afraid to get up to the line, go tempo, and get off a quick run at, right after that for the first. Cougars show blitz. They'll rush four. Pratt off his spot. Tucks it under. He'll try and run for it and gets a first down and then some. Terrific decision by a true freshman. As he got out of the pocket, makes a big play. They said last week the moment didn't look too big for him. And I'm not allowed to tattle on the community. We might have got away with a bit of a hold there at right guard, but enough for a first down nearing the red zone for a team that can get back to the ground game that it loves so much. Quarterback keeper. And Pratt stood up right at the line. So it will be second down and 10. Is that the code of offensive linemen? You see holding as clear as day on television, and you just have to swallow the whistle yourself. No flag, no hold, Bob. Got it. That is the law of the land. And I'm not one to betray the trust, especially <laughs> we talked about it before, as you see, Corey Dublin there making his Coming into this one, 41 consecutive starts. A lot of experience on that side versus the youth on the other side. But this team, we talked so much about. Yeah, Michael Pratt came in against Southern Miss, and they had this offensive turnaround. But so many of their big plays came from the run game. One you saw Pratt getting involved in a bit there. Well, the officials apparently went over to the Tulane sideline, and somehow the green wave have been given the down back, so it is still first down and 10. And a straight ahead run gets four. And whether Cam Carroll picks up four, it'll be second down and six. Cam Carroll, eight touchdowns on the young season so far, leading the country, and a guy who had to step up. Tajay Spears, number 22 for them. A great back goes down in their last game with a season-ending injury. And so the rest of this group, a deep group, has to pick up the slack. Cameron Carroll finds a cutback lane. Two-yard shot of a first down. But that puts the green wave in the red zone. Anini makes the stop. It'll be third down and two. And again, this is an area of the field where you've got a comfortable knowledge that you can go for it on fourth down. This might be a good looking shot at the end zone. You've got Mikel Jones singled up near the bottom. Maybe look his way as you've got DBs pressed up on your wideouts. Little option pitch and a fumble. And jumping on top of it is the quarterback, Michael Pratt. So that will undoubtedly end up as a field goal opportunity for Tulane. As the muff on third down makes it fourth and long. And these are all timing things right here. Being in phase, it's called, with that pitch player as a quarterback, understanding your relation to him and just having the reps underneath your belt, getting it out there, all things for a guy making his first start as a true freshman that are going to come with time. Unfortunately, that doesn't help them there. So Merrick Lover, fourth all-time in two-lane history and points scored. And that's why. Very consistent kicker. Puts it through, and it's a 10-point lead for the Green Wave. We'll have game five of the NBA Finals tomorrow night, 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific, on ABC, ESPN Deportes, and the ESPN app. LeBron and the Lakers back in control of the series, up three games to one over Jimmy Buckets in the Heat. Our coverage starts with NBA Countdown at 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. Will it be ring number four in finals appearance number 10 for LeBron tomorrow night? 10th finals appearance. I mean, my NBA lifetime is basically the LeBron James show in this. And what he's done 
bringing a franchise that after Kobe Bryant left the Lakers, unfortunately the late Kobe Bryant, a franchise that had really lost its way on the basketball court, and LeBron James in a matter of years able to bring them back to the stage that they're accustomed to being on, and now on the cusp of adding to a pretty impressive legacy already. It's so rarely in sports, think about the number of times you hear a name from an athlete in high school. And from the time you hear that guy's name in high school, he turns out to be everything that you were told he was going to be when he was 16 years old. On and off the court, remarkable. Now well, Houston is down by 10, and they have been, Mike Golick Jr., their own worst enemy. You've got to limit the catastrophe early on here for Houston. That's the good stuff, getting the ball away. Free hitters have been the issue, and Kevin Henry has been a nightmare for them. Getting some great schemed up looks at the quarterback, Clayton Toon, for Houston, and forcing a couple of defensive scores. Houston's got to get back out here and just get back into some rhythm, avoid the big mistake by doing what Dana Holgerson and this offense want to do. Get a few pass plays down the field to loosen things up and then start to really pound in the middle of this defense in the run game. Kyle Porter on first down. Picks up about three. Again, Tulane has played three games already. Many teams in college football have played four games at this point. And yet Houston had five different opponents going back to the beginning of the season cancel as no team more emblematic of the problems of trying to play during a pandemic than the Cougars, but they pick up a first down and more here. Speedy Stevenson lost the football. Was he down? They'll say no. It is a fumble recovery for Darius Hodges and another giveaway by the Cougars. Another thing you're probably not getting in this extended training camp Live punches at the football. We see it hits off his own knee as he's getting dragged down and comes loose. All the little things that come with game reps, game reps that Stevenson has, and just another nightmare scenario for this Houston offense. A no doubt about it fumble. He was being dragged down on a pretty benign tackle by Marvin Moody. And with his own knee, knocks the ball out. So another opportunity for a true freshman quarterback, Michael Pratt, with great field position starting at midfield after the third turnover by Houston. First two result in defensive scores. Pratt takes a shot to the sideline, and Deuce Watts, strong hands to pull that one down for a gain of 10. Deuce Watts, one of the twins, him and his brother Fat, number three who you'll see in this offense. Going up and getting it, what a high point. As we know all about this ground game, this is a receiving core. They're really outside of Jacob Robertson, doesn't come in with a ton of gain experience for Tulane as they've leaned on this running back depth through the early portion of the season. Pratt tucks it under and runs again. He's got another first down. Slides. Caught from behind by Donovan Mewton, but there is a flag down. Got that much room to run. There's usually a reason. Open. We are having some problems with our referee microphone, but you may have been able to make out that that's the left tackle, Joey Claybrook, 79, right in the middle of your picture, guilty of the hole. A veteran on this line here gets the swim move on the inside, and boy, when it's jammed up like that, I, I, again, I know I'm biased as an offensive lineman, but that's a pretty weak holding call based on what we're used to seeing. Everyone mashed up inside there. That puts them right back at midfield, but now it's first down and 20. Stephon Hutterson picks up eight. Now we're seeing Tulane go to this two running back backfield, try and buy you an extra blocker on some of these run plays.
create a different alignment by the defense and try and buy yourself a gap here as they get back up to the line and try and get ready to go. Play action. Easy check down to Hutterson. First down and more. Nice play design by Tulane, making it very easy on a true freshman quarterback, Michael Pratt. High percentage completions and very efficiently moving the ball. And very similar to what you'd see on rollout plays going to a tight end here, where all of a sudden, same backfield action you're getting on these runs, bodies going across the formation, and then you just squeak him out to the backside. And you see with this personnel, with Amari uh, Jones and the capability he has as a receiver, being able to keep your pedal on the gas and the defense, no chance to substitute. Broken tackle by Amari Jones, trying to fight his way back to the line of scrimmage. He'll lose only one, but could have lost a handful. And this is a great job in understanding by Peyton Turner, number 98, flying upfield, seeing that motion, and just getting Amari Jones to stop his feet. That's all you need on these East-West plays so that the rest of the cavalry can come calling. What might be the last play of the first quarter. And a wild first quarter it has been. Tulane with two touchdowns, both scored by their defense. Play clock at five, second down and 11. We'll keep it on the ground. And to start the second quarter, it'll be third down and long for the Green Wave at the 25-yard line of the Cougars. Well, Willie Prince gets two scores from his defense in the first quarter. A pick six by Macon Clark. A fumble caused by Kevin Henry. Recovered in the end zone by Jeffrey Johnson. And Tulane's got the 10-point lead. Fritz coaching his fourth game this season for Dana Holgerson on the right head coach of course of the Cougars this is their opener and they are showing that opening game rust by turning it over three times in the first quarter a couple of times resulting in defensive touchdowns for Tulane and now the green wave facing third down and nine to start the second quarter Bob Wachusa, Mike Golick Jr., Chris Budden on Thursday Night Football, and a deflected pass finds its way to Jacob Robertson for a first down. And a great job coming off the bunch side to your left. You see another five-man rush. They get just enough up front, gets tipped. But Robertson coming towards the middle away from that bunch finds an easy look at a first down. And now I'd expect a healthy dose of this inside zone Tulane loves to run. Hutterson on first and 10 from the 11. Slippery down to about the seven yard line, picks up four. Brought down by Giovanni Stewart, grad transfer from West Virginia. He played for Dana Holgerson there. Hutterson again, down to the one yard line. That should be good for a first down. It looks like it will be first down and goal for the Green Wave from the one. And they told us when the game's on the line and they need yardage, tempo tight inside zone. Stephon Hutterson loses a yard with a flag down as well. Maybe too much tempo. Oh, and it looks like it got the desired effect. A defense struggling to get lined up right. I think you're going to have a defender in the neutral zone. I think Donovan Mutin was more Defense. than just in the neutral zone. <laughs> After this to the goal line, repeat first down. It's just about lined up in the backfield. Line of scrimmage is at the one, and number three in red was lined up at about the two. And that's why you're running that tempo if you're two lane. Let's test and see how the game speed looks for Houston's defense the first time out. They had a slow, disjointed start because their defense. Quarterback sneak, a little push for Michael Pratt. Is he in? It is a touchdown. So the Green Wave extend their lead. Michael Pratt with his second rushing touchdown of the season. And unfortunately, I don't think all the pointing is going to help Houston. 
all too much here. And again, guys getting lined up just at the snap. As you see Pratt going up over the top, the mass of humanities, that's all that is, is elbows and teeth down there. Everyone just trying to crab out of there, and your freshman goes up over the top, ball across the plane, no doubter. At this point after it goes through, this will be 21 points off turnovers. And there it is. 24 on the board for Tulane, and 21 courtesy of Houston Giveaways. We're just beginning the college football weekend. What a way to end it. Saturday Night Football, 7.30 Eastern on ABC and the ESPN app. De'Eric King, Trevor Lawrence, they square off. It's Miami and Clemson in a top 10 matchup. And with the resurgence of the Canes, boy, it makes that game highly anticipated. Bob Shoes and Mike Golick Jr. and Chris Budden bringing you an American Conference matchup between Tulane and Houston. And the Cougars so far have served this one up for Tulane. 21 points off of turnovers for the Green Wave. I'm really excited to watch De'Ara King on Saturday night, of course. He ends up as a red shirt transfer to Miami after putting up wonderful numbers for Houston. And now he's got the Canes in the top 10. He does. It. There are very few players in college football that bend the field, that have the defense's eyes all focused on him before each and every snap because you can get the rest of the play fitted up perfectly. And one in that Hurricanes uniform can make you wrong in a heartbeat. He is an angle eraser. Leighton Toon, incomplete. Tried to fit one into Jeremy Singleton. Well, Chris Budden, obviously there are some fans in the building, but this is not your normal college football atmosphere. Yeah, and that's one of the things that you gain experience with through 2020 football season is needing to create your own energy because even though there's only 10,000 fans here, it doesn't feel very loud. It still feels very quiet and you start to notice kind of a flat sideline on that Houston side. Clayton Toon trying to keep his guys in it will go up after each series saying stay with it, stay with it. But that's something that is different that comes with playing each game in this football season. And now it's third down and 11. And it's incredible and you're used to having all the advantages that come with playing in your home stadium and instead now you're right. It's a great point by Chris. Every other team's gotten a crack at this, understands how difficult the prospect of making that energy is. Dune sets up the screen to Mulbacar. He's got room to run. Well designed screen and a third down conversion. Much needed for the Cougars. And a great job of timing on this screen. Watch him stay in phase with these offensive linemen, give his big boys time to get out front, and there's plenty of room. A great job sealing off the inside and creating a great lane for the running back. Delayed handoff to Carr. He lost a couple. Did not fool Dorian Williams. And a great job by Dorian Williams right now. You've seen him kind of staying down there, spying on the quarterback after we saw Clayton Toon use his legs a few times early on. Mirroring the back on those last couple of plays. He's been active for them early. Led the team in tackles with 10 last week against Southern Miss. Blitz off the edge, picked up. Toon has time, finds a soft spot in the zone and Keith Corbin. Well, that time the pass protection held up and Clayton Toon made it pay off. And a great job by Mobacar, you see right there, fitting up. You got players up in the line of scrimmage, they drop out. You get the blitzer coming off the edge, trying to buy up the eyes, but Mobacar not fooled. And when your quarterback's got time, he's got an easy pitch and catch down the field when you get some of those zone blitzes. Again, the pass protection there. Toon wants a deep shot down the sideline, and with one arm hauling it in, inside the five-yard line is Trayvon Bradley. 
And again, another great deep ball by Clayton Toon. And what concentration Bradley using and being physical, almost like a basketball player boxing out there, using that back arm to shield himself, give his right arm some space to work. Set him up right down by the goal line. We saw that two-back formation come out. We're seeing the diamond here. And that diamond formation may have caused the sideline for Tulane to say, hold up a second. We don't have a defense drawn up for this, so a timeout called on defense. has plenty of elements of the air raid offense going all the way back to Mike Leach and Hal Mummy. Unbelievable mullet look right there. But the tree <laughs> that's branched off of that is one where we've seen concepts take over not only college football, the Lincoln Rileys of the world, Sonny Dykes, but Cliff Kingsbury now bringing it to the NFL. Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, Baker Mayfield, all these great guys bringing to Sunday what we've seen on Saturday and the evolution for so long. The original air raid you think spread out, run and gun. But Dana Holgerson, when he was the offensive coordinator here at Houston, those two back sets. When he got to Oklahoma State, you saw some of this. These three back diamond backfields trying to give some misdirection, some eye candy. It's all the growth and evolution of this offense under Dana Holgerson. Lob pass into the end zone. Underthrown for Stevenson, but a flag out. Willie Langham was trying to stay with Marquez Stevenson. And it looks like Speedy draws a penalty. And Bob, again, set of downs. these are designed underthrows. You're giving your guy a chance to go up and get it and come back through the defender. Because again, you see eight's back is turned to the quarterback, so he knows he's not gonna see that ball until the last minute and run right into your wide receiver. First and goal from the two. Keelan Walker is brought down at the one. You know, it is amazing when you think about how the whole collective world of football just gave side eye to Mike Leach and Hal Mummy back in the day, right? And now in the NFL, star quarterbacks, some of the most efficient and explosive offenses in professional football have the air raid as a part of their DNA. Three number one picks and, oh, by the way, Patrick Mahomes, who's pretty good. Yeah, he's not bad. Again, that same lob into the end zone. Incomplete, this time an overthrow for Stevenson. Now it's third down and goal from the one. This is just my time to re-up and join one of our colleagues, a great NFL analyst, Mina Kimes, as someone who is very anti-goal line fade, as you give another look at one of your great receivers. And I understand it when you like the matchup, when you like and trust the receiver like Stevenson. But now in this situation, put it on the ground. Let your line go to work. Malbacar. That's a Mina Kimes play to the goal line. Short. Now it's fourth down and goal from inside the one. I have to think Mina approves of the play call here, right? Power football from the one yard line, but Absolutely. he doesn't get in. But great penetration by this Tulane defensive line, and we said they're going to have to live behind the backfield. And an easy decision here. Get right over the top, let your quarterback keep it, just like we saw from Tulane. Quarterback sneak, a push for Clayton Toon. Did he get in? No signal as of yet. Tulane thinks they've got him stopped. It's a touchdown. Very late signal coming in from the headlines, but along the near sideline. But somehow in the middle of that pile, Clayton Toon found his way across the chalk and is credited for a touchdown. And this was the difficulty for Toon. He couldn't get the ball from out underneath his center initially. Another issue with the exchange, some of the ball handling that we've seen tonight for Houston, Toon comes out of there. Normally, you'll see quarterbacks, think Matthew Stafford in the NFL, dive over the pile, poke that football out. He gets it stuck on his center's rear end right there and has to rely on everyone pushing him from behind. So another instance where they get in because they're so close to the goal line, but the way you went about executing that still leaves a lot to be desired. And when you're laying on top of your teammates, unless the officials come in and say forward progress is stopped, he wasn't down. You can keep grinding the ball and in the middle of all those bodies trying to get it across the goal line. And he did. And we know in a post-Bush-Push era, you are allowed to 
help him over the goal line. He got just enough help, but we have a flag down on the point after truck. Outside. We're not. So that penalty will be declined. The try is good. And the two lane lead has been cut to 10. So Clayton Toon with his first rushing touchdown of the season. ESPN College Football, presented by Capital One, is brought to you by Coca-Cola. Together tastes better. This Jalen McCleskey, 53-yard catch and run with three seconds to go. Capped a wild Thursday night win by Tulane last year over Houston after the Green Wave faked a kneel down. Amari Jones, you saw, run for 18 yards to set up what turned out to be the game winner. This is the third straight year that these two teams have met in prime time on Thursday night. Tulane last year, they were down 21 at one point and came back to stun the Cougars 38 to 31. And they've got a 10 point lead tonight, 21 points off turnovers. As it will now come out to the 25 yard line. Now let's take you from plan to play. Brought to you by Northwestern Mutual. And Mike, that last touchdown drive, very efficient for Houston. And all set up by making easy plays. You see the screen here to start things off. Great job by the offensive line creating throwing lanes for Clayton Toon here and the easy pitch and catch. But his deep ball giving his receivers a chance to go up and make a play before they go over the top with a little help from his friends to put it in and cross the goal line. Somewhere in that mosh pit, Clayton Toon was deemed to have broken the plane. So now how will the true freshman Michael Pratt respond? Play action on first down, under pressure. He'll eat the football and take a sack. Could have thrown it away, held onto it just long enough to give David Anini a chance to bring him down. And watch the change of direction here by Anini. 12 puts a foot in the ground, gets back upfield. And this is a true freshman mistake right here. You've got to get that ball thrown away. You are not outrunning these guys at the Division I level in that spot. Get the ball out, live to play another day. Don't put your team in a disadvantage situation early in the down. Second down and 21, and conservative for only a yard. So it will be third down and a mile as Cameron Carroll barely got back across the line of scrimmage. And I understand you're worried about your quarterback after taking that sack there, but a second and 21 run never makes a ton of sense to me. Here. You're not backed up enough to where you've got to worry about your punter on the shadow of the goal line. Why not take a shot there and instead now, third in the country mile, get ready for a screen or another run. And again, they'll just play to punt. As Carroll will pick up six, maybe seven yards. But it will be a three and out for Tulane set up on first down by the Anini sack. And that all goes back to just the understanding that comes with time under task as the starter to get rid of that ball and have it be second and 10 instead of second and 21 to start this drive off. Marcus Drones driven all the way back inside his own 20 yard line by a bomb of a punt from Ryan Wright. It is returnable though. As he gets out to about the 32 yard line before he is brought down. Well, you can kick off week five Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern. The countdown crew will have all the early breaking stories and who knows what might happen between now and kickoff on Sunday. Our Monday night football matchup as well. The Chargers taking on the Saints. 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on ESPN, ESPN Deportes, and the ESPN app. After a 63-yard punt, and of course, that's not the only Monday night game again this week, as Denver, New England has been moved to Monday night also. The Titans-Bills game on Sunday postponed now to Tuesday. There's a keeper for Clayton Toon. And he's brought down right at the line of scrimmage by Chase Kirschen. 
and the Bills and Kansas City Chiefs. Now, they were scheduled to play next Thursday night, one week from tonight. You can't play Tuesday and then Thursday. So with the Titans-Bills game being delayed until Tuesday, Bills-Chiefs moves to next Sunday. All due to trying to play football in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic. Toon, he's going to take a shot. Just barely missing Jeremy Singleton. It'll be third down and ten. Houston trying to take advantage of any one-on-one -on -one opportunity they've got. We saw Bradley with the big catch before. Certainly we expect it out of Stevenson here. Just overthrowing and getting used to that timing. All the things that are going to come as they get games under their belt. But right now, again, week one of actually being on the field in game action for the Cougs here. Maybe time for another screen like we saw that jump-started that last drive. Team shot is there for Speedy Stevenson. And a flag comes in on third down. And they might be taking a look at targeting on that one. You saw the safety coming in, lowering his head as Stevenson was going to the ground. Stevenson held on to the football. Targeting and there is the target. <laughs> so if this is confirmed by replay, and again it must be confirmed by the replay booth, Larry Brooks, who started at strong safety, would be lost for the night. You're seeing crown of the helmet, defenseless player. Have a feeling this could not go too lane's way. Welcome back, and it looks like a targeting call is going to be reversed by replay in favor of Larry Brooks of Tulane. Forcible hit by the crown of the helmet would result in a targeting ejection. That certainly looks forcible by the crown of the helmet to us, but not to the replay booth. Hey, you know what? Looking at it again, maybe you can argue it wasn't violent. We know that's supposed to be a forcible contact, an attack, a launch with the crown of the helmet there and maybe they look at that and say not violent enough in that situation I never want to see someone thrown out of the game I understand what we're trying to eliminate but that one there seemed a little less forceful than what they're trying to really iron out yeah, to me the goal of the rule is to get players to not do that and so hopefully Larry Brooks realizes he may have gotten the benefit of the doubt from replay here but don't do that again another deep shot from Clayton Toon one on one Knocked away. Jalen Monroe. Terrific coverage on Nathaniel Dell. It'll be second and ten. Monroe step for step with him the entire way next to Dell, tracking it with his eyes. And we've seen so many two-lane defenders turned around staring at the chest of the wide receiver. Monroe says, no, I'll get my eyes back on the ball and I'll play this right with you. Kyle Porter with a cutback. First down. Picks up 12. And this is the counter action. Houston loves to run. Get big 64 Dennis Bardwell out there moving in space, coming across the line from that right tackle spot. Running back makes the great decision to let him go by and take up some space. Porter again. Into the secondary again. Got eight more yards. You know, the law of unintended consequences. Last year, Houston, De'Ara King decides to redshirt, then transfer, and a whole host of players redshirt along with them. But that meant that a lot of players that might not have gotten a significant amount of playing experience last year did. Kyle Porter, part of a group that's 70% of the rushing yards from last season to this season that returns for Houston. And now some players that wouldn't be all that experienced this year. Look pretty comfortable out there now that this offense getting into a groove. Chandler Smith spun down right at the first down line to gain by Chase Kirschen. It'll be third down and a half yard. And they have gone to the same counter play each of the last three plays. They've got third and less than one right now. 
This is begging for Dana Holgerson to go over the top here, understanding he'll have a great chance at a fourth down look right now. This is a great opportunity to take a calculated risk, knowing you've been beating the defense up, although this heavy formation may indicate otherwise. Up there, two for five on third down. And that extra push looks like they will now be three for six on third down. Big bodies in front, big bodies in back. A quarterback can't ever feel safer than in that formation. <laughs> Christian Trahan, a 245-pound tight end, gave the shove that Toon needed. And it's a third down conversion to keep the drive alive. Ninth play of this drive. Four-man rush, Toon towards the end zone. Looking for Keith Corbin, but he was bracketed. All eyes on Corbin there. And we know right now, no Stevenson on the field. Remember, though, the targeting call was reversed. He was in the tent earlier. One of their best players not on the field. They'll run it with Mulbacar, and he won't go anywhere. Brought down right at the line of scrimmage. It will be third down and ten. There's Marvin Moody in on another tackle. And in defending this run game, Marvin Moody's been right up at the line of scrimmage. Tulane has put five guys up near the line of scrimmage, trying to get an athletic mismatch on the center, Jack Freeman, for Houston, getting into the backfield, disrupting the run. Soon out of the pocket. Flag down. He's got a wide open man in the end zone. It's Keandre Street. That's a touchdown if the play stands. Looking like a lot of hands up around the line of scrimmage. This one may be coming back due to holding after what looked like a great pickup initially by a Houston offense that's seen a similar pressure a handful of times already. We'll wait and see some comms issues for the referee crew tonight, it appears. Holding. Defense. That penalty's declined. The result of the play is a touchdown. After the play, unsportsmanlike conduct, number 76. Defense. That's this far. The penalty will be enforced on the kickoff. So it turns out to be a defensive hold and an easy pitch and catch touchdown soon to Keandre Street. And we've seen that pressure before. Five up on the line, you drop off one of the ends, and the line picks it up, gives Toon time to get back, survey, roll out a little bit, and find his receiver sitting wide open in the end zone. Dalton Witherspoon makes it a three-point game with a flag down. Looked like it may have been a neutral zone infraction for Tulane. It was offsides on the green wave. Offside, Ray. So it's 24-21 as Houston now down by three. And watch right in the middle here the trap by the center, Jack Freeman, as he gets started on this play. Got a linebacker mugged up again in his face, gets him down on the ground and clogs it up. So now that secondary blitzer runs right into his buddy there on the ground, gives Clayton Toon enough time to roll out to the side 
That's a great job there. We said the defense was trying to take advantage of the athletic mismatch for Marvin Moody, their linebacker in that situation. Center makes him pay with power. Easy six. That might have been a good illustration of what we talked about the fear would be for Tulane and their defense in this game. They benefited by bringing blitzers early, got a pick six, knocked the ball out, and got a fumble recovery for a touchdown, but kind of live by the sword, die by the sword, right? If you bring blitzers and you don't get there, you're trying to cover some really speedy receivers with some maybe less than athletic players in the back end of your defense. It, it, it is, and even in a zone blitz situation like you got there, once Houston started to stop these, they were free hitters for Tulane before. And the worst thing is an offensive lineman, you know, if they get home with a pressure early on, you're going to see plenty of it. They shut one of their key ones down there. Now Tulane's got to go back in the defensive playbook, back down the call card and find what's next. They'd have to kick off from the 20-yard line, though, so that sets up a return opportunity for Hutterson and pretty good field position for Tulane. Let's check in with Kevin Connors. And Bob, coming up on the Dr. Pepper Halftime Report, we've got some big COVID-related news out of the Big 12 to share with you. Jesse Palmer, Joey Galloway will be here to share their impressions on the first half. And it's college football pick em for the first time this season. The guys will debate who's going to win the Miami Clemson showdown. All coming up when you join us at the half, Bob. Well, so much about this season is abnormal, but the more games we get back and the bigger the games become, the more normal it feels. As this play blown dead at the line of scrimmage. And before too long, we'll have Big Ten football back. Not long after that, Pac-12 football back. False start. Grimady, the offense. Did not get set with a snap. Five-yard penalty. First down. Bob Oshusen here with Mike Gola Jr. Chris Budden with us as well. The fourth game of this season for Tulane, but with five cancellations, it's the first game for the Cougars, and they looked rusty early. Three first quarter giveaways, two defensive touchdowns scored by Tulane, and yet the Cougars' offense has now made this a three-point game, and now their defense starts humming. Peyton Turner with a tackle behind the line. We've seen Peyton Turner getting upfield quickly, stopped a jet sweep earlier, and this time slow developing counterplay. You've got both the guard and tackle pulling on the backside, trying to create a seam, and he gets upfield and says, now nah, I'm going to put a stop to all that. And now you're back, and again, disadvantage situation. Last drive, it was taking an ill-advised sack. This drive, it was the penalty to start things off, getting in the hole early for this Tulane offense. Right up the middle goes Cameron Carroll. It'll be third down and long. I would think if you're Houston, you'd probably want to call a timeout here. Tulane facing third down and about 11. And if I were the Green Wave, I'd take as much time off the clock as I could, anticipating I'll probably have to punt. And Houston still with two timeouts. They two are time allowing the clock to run. Two timeouts, you think you'd get the ball back with about two minutes left, be able to work the length of the field with those. That's a situation they've been drilling in this extended training camp for 53 days. Third down and 11. Pratt to throw, check that quarterback run, and he only picks up a yard or two, and now will Houston call a timeout? Looks like Dana Holgerson may do just that. Yes, they will call a timeout on defense, try and preserve some time for their offense. And you see a great job, some defenders, multiple defenders coming on that pressure on the outside. The feet get caught up a little bit, but Javarius Owens able to recover, get back inside, get to the quarterback and put a healthy hit on. The last couple of drives, this Houston defense has made the true freshman feel that physical presence, starting to make him think a little bit. Let's take a look at this week's AP rankings brought to you by Goodyear, and it's good to see those Big Ten teams Included in the AP top 10 again, of course, the big one, number one against number seven, 7.30 on ABC Saturday night. Clemson takes on Miami. Also a night game, Alabama at Ole Miss on ESPN on Saturday night. So a couple of good ones. Ryan Wright, a 63-yarder on his last attempt. And this one, again, a good deep kick. Breaking tackles, though, Marcus Jones. And he's out to the 30-yard line before he's driven out of bounds. 
So back to the offense for Clayton Toon. We saw the bad early. We've seen the good of late. Issues with protection up front led to him just trying to do a little bit too much going down there in the pocket. But since Houston's been able to do a better job keeping their quarterback clean and upright, they've had a lot more opportunities like this, easy shots at the end zone. Not afraid to take the looks one-on-one -on -one downfield. You see the extra time here again. And we've seen, they have a lot of confidence. They brought back their top four receivers from last season. And they saw what the other side of this looked like. Last year, they were up 21 points. Gave up that recovery to Tulane. They came all the way rushing back for a win. So they've seen, this is the American. Anyone who watched that Memphis SMU game last weekend knows all about how quickly things can turn and how much offense is ready to fire away in this conference. Touchdowns on their last two possessions, double-digit touchdown drives, and Tulane now on the flip side. They've gone three and out. Their last two possessions in a row, and Houston has a chance to possibly lead at halftime. Let's we'll see what happens on this drive. And obviously with an offense that goes at their tempo, two minutes and 16 seconds, end of timeout, that's all the time in the world. Harrison Vaughn having to be helped off the field. Certainly see him not putting a ton of weight being helped off there. And I know we've said it a number of times, but game one, you certainly hope it's something he can recover from. No worse feeling as a teammate looking at a guy who you've gone through all this, you've dealt with all the adversity of not knowing when and if your season was going to start to try and get out here for that first game and see anybody go down. We've already seen Stevenson in the injury tent before, so you hope these guys able to recover. As unfortunately, he's getting into the cart, which is a, a very unfortunate sign here. go through a 53-day training camp to finally get a chance to play. And now, and now the worst part, Bob, they blow the whistle and they play the next snap. Yep. It is one of the cruelest parts of this game. Everyone has seen and lived through it who's put on a pa set of pads and helmets and it never gets any easier to try and get through. Clayton Toon, his 10th career start, back to work. And a jet sweep end around. Stevenson. Stays in bounds. Speedy Stevenson turning on the Jets. A well-designed play for the Cougars and a first down. And watch the big fella get loose in the open field here. Jack Freeman, the center, working all the way out to the perimeter, getting a pancake on a defensive back. And it looks like it was too good. It looks like a flag down. Repeat first down. And that is the difficulty when you get into space on those shots. That's why, quite frankly, getting out into these screens, a lot of times, that's why they'll coach you as an offensive lineman to throw, to go for the cut block in space. Because trying to get hands on some of these smaller athletes is so difficult and stay with them. If you throw right there, you potentially take out both guys in that spot. And instead, you get the takedown. Two points for that on the wrestling mat. None here on the football field. It's a spot foul, so it sets up an unusual first down and 12. As they lose a couple of yards with the penalty. Two. He'll go down. Sacked. A two-yard loss. Now it will be second down and 14 for Houston. Now Tulane also has their timeouts. So we'll see if the Green Waves spend one. Probably based on the outcome of this play. And you'd assume Houston going back to the air here. So if you get an incompletion, you get a natural clock stoppage, and all of a sudden you're right back in good shape with Houston backed up. Toon will throw on second and 14. Wants to set up a screen. That's incomplete. So that stops the clock for the green wave and also creates third down at 14. And we mentioned how often you drill the two-minute drill going through the course of training camp. That's something coaches will set this amount of time on the clock. You've got two timeouts, this length of the field to go, and you work through, but it's so different. Again, getting back into the flow of a real game, seeing the penalties called much more diligently, and now finding yourself in this situation where you're going to try and take some time off the clock and punt.
Low throw, incomplete. Well, McGowan couldn't scoop it up. So that preserves both two-lane timeouts with a minute 16 to go. And again, a little baffled. You're well short of the sticks, and we see the ball low. No contest there on the catch, but the decision to call a play that lands you well short of the sticks, knowing you're going to stop the clock if that happens, and now put them in a situation where you're right. Plenty of time and two timeouts in your pocket. You've got a chance to go to work. On third and 14, if you're going to throw a five-yard out, why not just run the ball and force the opposition to at least use one of their timeouts? And this punt will take a Houston roll down inside the 20-yard line to the 17. Well, this area and certainly the entire Gulf Coast is keeping their eye on the approaching hurricane. And, of course, this is an area that has been soaked this season and windblown as well by tropical system after tropical system. And so we are all keeping our fingers crossed and saying our prayers that this one does less damage than they anticipate. But heard Chris Budden earlier talk about the fact that Tulane does have some contingency travel plans and even a hotel set up back in New Orleans should there be any shift in the track of the storm. And they have a any difficulty in getting the team back into the dorms on campus. So Tulane back to work, minute five to go, and they've got two timeouts. They'll start on the ground, and it will start with a tackle for loss. Cameron Carroll brought down well behind the line of scrimmage. Logan Hall makes the stop, helped out by DeAnthony Jones. And not a lot of sense of urgency here. They're content to let this one get to the halftime locker room without putting their true freshman quarterback in too much of harm's way, a chance to risk anything like a turnover down here. Carroll again. Brought down behind the line again and goes out of bounds. Well, this makes things interesting. 20 seconds on the clock. It's now third down. That stops the clock for the Cougars, and Houston still has a timeout. A, a lot of very poor situational awareness right now on both sides, something going into the halftime locker room for these teams. You're going to address, and for Tulane, this is game four of your season, so these are the mistakes you can't see happening. That wasn't a true freshman that just ran out of bounds. Dana Holgerson can now turn his defense loose and use their final timeout as Carroll stays inbounds this time, but now undoubtedly the Cougars will call timeout and force Tulane to punt. And who knows? Special teams in college football. You watch enough of these games, you realize anything can happen on special teams in college football. Especially with the guys that Houston has going back there to return. Marcus Jones, who spent a couple of years as a starter at Troy, was an All-American punt returner there. He's a guy that knows what to do with the ball in his hands in these situations. I talked to a coach one time who was in the NFL, went back to college football as an offensive coordinator. And I knew him, and I saw him at a training facility. And I said, wow, you were in the NFL, now back in college. What's the biggest difference? The quarterbacks, the receivers, what? He said, oh, no, don't talk to me. Go talk to our special teams coach. I said, really? He said, any time in college football that the ball clears the line of scrimmage on special teams, usually you're happy. In the NFL, every punter's got a nuclear leg. They can all directional kick to the 10-yard line. Every 50-yard field goal, it seems like it's good. Special teams can be an adventure. And Houston just about got there, but Ryan Wright got it away. And this will roll with five seconds to go in the half to midfield. Well, at least a chance for Houston to maybe throw the ball in the end zone. And again, the coaching point right there is you're going through the block point, two hands and down at the punter's leg. Give yourself a better shot to erase that edge. Bob, I've never been on a punt rush team, but I've been sitting as an offensive lineman in enough special teams meetings to pick up some of the ancillary knowledge. You? you I know. Never part of punt rush? 
I know it seems shocking. That is I was amazing. one of the unfortunate souls part of that meat shield back wall right there. <laughs> Mike, go ahead there and shorten your neck. I'm just Six amazed. Six plays a game. That no coach looked to use your athleticism ah. on punt block. That's just a complete misuse of your talent. Well, Clayton Toon, I'm going to run a little hitch to Jeremy Singleton. He's going to get what he can with one second to go on the clock. I can't imagine that's going to put them in any reasonable field goal range, but that will draw Clayton Toon just a little bit closer to see if he can reach the end zone with one last snap, as now they will set up for the Big Ben play and put three receivers up to the top of your screen. So you see the jump ball team coming out there with Keandre, Keandre Street, all six foot three of him, that third man in. Toon extending, allowing those receivers to get downfield, and now puts one short of the end zone, and it's an easy interception for Macon Clark, his second interception of the half. You remember he opened the scoring with a pick six. And Tulane will start the third quarter with the football and a three-point lead. Time to head to the studio, the halftime report. Alongside Joey Galloway and Jesse Palmer, here's Kevin Connors. Welcome back to Thursday Night College Football presented by Capital One. You're watching the American Conference on ESPN. It was quite a wait for the Cougars. Their first five games canceled. Finally, they open their season tonight. Sloppy at the start. They turned it over three times in the first quarter. Tulane took advantage. It's a three-point lead for the Green Wave as we're set for the start of the third quarter. Bob Oshusen, Mike Golick Jr., Chris Button on hand in Houston. You, you could see the rust early on for Dana Holgerson's team. And you could see the struggle. Chris mentioned it, the energy on the sideline, all the factors that go into game day in 2020 that Houston was seeing for the first time. But they're able to settle in, find themselves, and they're down three, but it feels like the momentum has really gone back in their favor. How much pressure on the Tulane offense in the second half they were really carried by the defense in the first half. You would think if Houston plays clean, Tulane's going to have to generate some offense to hold this lead. And they're going to have to, on early downs, take the ball out of Michael Pratt's hands right now. The last couple of drives, we've seen them set back early. A bad sack taken by the true freshman. A false start penalty as the offense not ready to go on that drive. Put them at a disadvantage right away that they're not ready and mature enough to climb out of right now with him at the helm. Tulane will start the third quarter with the ball. We'll see if their offense is able to change some momentum that seemed to go the way of the Cougars before the end of the first half. As we take a look at tonight's game flow, brought to you by Progressive, and all the flow, courtesy of the Tulane defense early. A lot of free hits, and this was a Houston team knocking off every bit of that rust, turning guys loose. Namely, Kevin Henry, number 33, for Tulane, and giving up not just bad plays, but disaster plays that led to defensive scores. But easy completions, getting the ball down to mold the car on the screen, and then protection starting to improve. You see 75, Jack Freeman in the center of that line. Hold up, give your quarterback time, and you've got athletes like Keandre Street on the outside that are going to get open against the secondary when given the chance. So the true freshman, Michael Pratt, to work from his own 25-yard line. End around, Amari Jones gets a couple of blocks and picks up about eight yards. How about the comfort level of a true freshman quarterback that, by the way, was homeschooled until he was in ninth grade? Michael Pratt didn't really even start playing football until he was a freshman in high school and then ends up at Deerfield Beach High School in a team that sent 16 players to Power 5 schools as he hands one off to Cameron Carroll. So he did a lot of winning once he finally became a true high school football player, but this is his first career start. And they said the pedigree of going to a high school like Deerfield is why he came in with a lot of confidence early on and why they didn't see a lot of the normal things that come with a true freshman in practice and certainly when he was part of that great comeback they mounted against Southern Miss. And now we have an injured Green Wave player. It looks, 
Looks like it might be Trey Tuggle. We'll check in and see, and let's head to Chris Budden. We well, mentioned all the stars that came out of Deerfield Beach High School, and Pratt has a tattoo in honor of one of those. It was Bryce Gowdy, a wide receiver at Deerfield Beach High School, wore the number seven. And you can see on his arm has Believe and the number seven tattooed on there. Gowdy took his own life in December. He had committed to play at Georgia Tech that entire 2019 class that played at Deerfield Beach has his memory all over their social media playing for number seven this year. And, and just an impossibly sad situation for everyone involved there. The, the Believe tattoo that you see right there on Pratt. And it's a reminder for everyone, mental health has become so much more of a conversation around athletics at every level. But in college, we've seen Holinsky's hope in honor of the late Tyler Holinsky being a part and being implemented in a lot of teams this past weekend as they look to shine a light on that, use that platform as Joey Claybrook being helped off the field right there to try and make sure that players understand just because you play a warrior sport doesn't mean you have to be quiet when things are wrong and that you can reach out and ask for help. And to see teams with this platform playing this sport using this opportunity to shine a light on that and to see some of his teammates that are all making sure people remember their brother Bryce, Gow Bryce Gowdy. I, I think it's an incredible time for athletes, especially college athletes, to use their voices around causes like this. Doc Prescott came out recently and was honest with family tragedy, the impact that it had on him. You're the star quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. Who should be happier than the star quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys? And he came out and admitted, hey, I'm a human being. I have the weight of the world at times coming down on my shoulders, family tragedy, and, and he was very honest about his feelings as well. Athletes have shown time and time again they're not immune to the terrible things that can come over the course of life and them using that platform shows someone else that might be hurting and afraid to speak out that they're not alone and that there are other people trying to work through some of the same problems. Big play here for Pratt, third down and 12. He's going to lob one down the sideline. Will he get the benefit of a flag? Fat Watts, the intended receiver, stumbled in front of Marcus Jones. Pressure put on Pratt by Peyton Turner. That looks like no flag out. And you see here, feet just getting tangled up at the top of the route here. A good no call as both of those ankles. But on the other side, Pratt taking a shot low. And that was Peyton Turner being blocked into him low, so not much he can do in that situation. But And a muffed punt! Loose inside the 25-yard line. Does Tulane have the recovery? It looks like they may. And they do. Players have to be separated after the whistle blows, but it looked like one of the officials stepped in and signaled green wave football. Marcus Jones, who we mentioned, an experienced and potent punt returner, just overshoots it a bit. You see him coming in here and then having to back up at that last second. Just lost it a little bit, tracking a lot of bodies around him. And now this is how Tulane got in this game, got a lead to begin with. Houston turning it over yet again, setting them up with great field position. Now here is the question, and I think the officials are taking a look at just this. Ryan Wright happy because that punt was muffed. However, Jatavian Tolls, a receiver, may have been out of bounds and jumped back in. I'm not sure he reestablished inbounds before he recovered the ball. We can't hear the referee's microphone. Replay will certainly take a look. Was Jatavian Tolls out of bounds? So we'll see right here, circled at the bottom of the screen, going towards the sideline. And he does, he stepped out of bounds and he wasn't pushed out of bounds. And it doesn't seem like he had time to maybe reestablish right there. Maybe they're saying because he dove back in, but he definitely went out of bounds, was not pushed out of bounds by anybody else. And didn't have time to get reset before he touched it. Let's take a look again. The previous play is under further. 
So the replay booth is indeed going to take a closer look. And you can't and be the first one to touch it again after that. And see if this should indeed be a huge break for Houston. Will they get the football back? We'll find out when we return. All here on ESPN, Bob Shoes and Mike Golick Jr. and Chris Button. And that right foot stepping out of bounds by Jatavian Tolls. Unfortunately for Tulane, costs them a takeaway. As we pointed out, once you are out of bounds, you have to re-establish back in bounds before you can recover that loose ball. That's a five-yard penalty. And so Dana Holgerson has opted to, not surprisingly, have Tulane back up five yards and kick the ball away again. One of the most dangerous plays in sports is the second round at a punt like this because now your punt team just ran down there to cover. They're a little bit worn out and your punt return has got a fresh look at this with even more space. The potential swing right here is just incredible coming off a play that could have been a very easy two lane turnover coming off that muff punt return now could end up being a big play going the other way from I'd imagine a very motivated Marcus Jones back there eager to erase the memory of that mistake. So it looks like we've got the ball now spotted correctly. The foul has been applied. There's a lot at the end of this play that the officials now have to re-rack. You have to make sure the clock's okay. You have to make sure that the original line of scrimmage is redetermined. Then you have to back the ball up five yards. There's a lot to unpack here after what looked initially to be a two-lane takeaway. And now we're set, Ryan Wright. We'll kick it again to Marcus Jones. This one takes a hop and a dangerous play by Jones, but boy does it pay off. He saves his team a boatload of field position, a return out to the 43-yard line. Risky decision by Marcus Jones, but a brave one. And if it, and had it been, pays off. And if it had been anyone else other than a veteran guy, maybe it would have taken him out of it. He gets a great chance. Let's check in with Chris Budd. Well, coming out of half, Dana Holgerson told me that those mistakes, turnovers early in the first were attributed to just maybe too many nerves over amped up. He said it's no one's fault. That's just what happens when you haven't had any game action. He did say, I think we got all those out of the system. He said, I thought my offense played great despite the fact that we spotted Tulane 17 points. It is interesting watching, though, trying to do still some of the small things right when you're not used to playing a game. The team was walking out of the tunnel, coming out here out of half, and the strength and conditioning coach had to go in and say, you guys should be sprinting out here. I want to see some energy. So, again, getting used to very kind of the routine of doing things on a game day. And creating your own energy. I'm wondering, Mike, when you were a player, how many games did it take you to work your way into a season where you felt like you were in a groove, like playing a game was what you were supposed to be doing and the rust was shaken off? It really was that week one to week two bump where you just remember how to prepare going into a game week. You'll do a lot of scrimmage environments where you'll prepare in the lead up like it's a game day. You'll simulate that as best you can. But once you've gone through it that first real time, gotten on that team bus and gone where you need to go, everything starts to slow down, even for the vets. Nothing there on first down. Great play by 48, DeAndre Williams, the defensive tackle, who lost a shoe in the process, but played, played, played back across the face and going to make the smart move, go down there, stop play for his team. A flat tire, but a tackle for loss all the same. So it's second down and 11. And he's a guy that Jack Curtis, their D coordinator, said one of the unsung heroes is going to make a lot of plays that won't necessarily show up or flash like a sack or a big time tackle for loss. Leighton Toon, little pick play out on the edge, frees up Keith Corbin. And he's got the first down and more. 16 yard gain to Corbin. 
and a great job getting the pick from the outside by Trevon Bradley coming in here and getting just enough. The offense calls it a rub, the defense calls it a pick. That time, perfectly executed to get just enough to slow him down. Draw play. Kyle Porter, two yards. Dorian Williams been incredibly active near the line of scrimmage. We saw him being the spy on Clayton Toon earlier, mirroring a lot of these running backs. Made a lot of plays for the angry wave. He led the green wave with 10 tackles last week. Four-man rush on second down and eight. Toon backpedaling. Out of the pocket. Going to tuck it under and run. Avoids the hit of Dorian Williams. And he steps out of bounds, three yards shy of a first down. So it will set up a Houston third down and three. We've seen the screen game be effective a few times. Just a great area of the field to try and find one. You've been running a lot of those counter runs. They've got great schemes built off of some of their run actions that can catch a defense off guard if they're not ready and bursting up field. Counter handoff. Van Porter, second effort. He's got the first down. And this is one of the big differences. Again, Dana Holgerson and his blend of the air raid want to get downhill, want to go at the heart of a defense. He knows he used to have to beg Mike Leach to call run plays during the course of a game, and he still wouldn't now. Dana gets to turn these guys loose downhill in the middle of the defense and try and get Tulane to commit an extra defender into the box, open up some of those one-on-one -on -one matchups for his wideouts. This will be a false start. And you see Keenan Murphy, the left guard right here, number 77, leaning hard to the right side of the field. As they're getting ready to run this counter play, you're going to watch him get ready to pull. He's falling back out of that stance. The D-line is watching the weight in his hands. I am the son of a defensive lineman, and I know they spent a lot of time looking at how much weight is going forward or backward to see if they can get any sort of tip like that. He's got to be careful. Four-man rush. Tune, six yard game. Trayvon Bradley. And you know the penalty yardage back plus one more, so it will be second down and nine. And Bob, that's one of those small things, but especially in an offense that loves to major in that counter play as often as Houston does, that you've got to really coach up. And that's something when you're in film on Monday, the coach is going to harp on. Our stance has to look the same each and every time we go up to the line of scrimmage. Right up the middle, spinning out of traffic is Kyle Porter. Close to a first down. Good feet from Kyle Porter, kept the play alive. And really nothing here, everything bottled up inside. He just keeps the legs churned and spins and makes a great play. This is a guy who we talked to Shannon Dawson, their offensive coordinator said, really has the emotional pulse of the team. So as they're looking for energy, he can be one of those guys that understands and leads in critical moments. Third down and one. Order again. And it looks like forward progress will give him the first down. Kyle Porter was the leading rusher last season. Started nine games and played 11 overall and ran for just over 600 yards. And he and Mulbacar, they... They form a pretty good one-two physical punch for a team that's known as a wide-open spread offense. They had five different players with a 100-yard rushing game over the course of last season. They want to get after you on the ground. Toon finds a crosser, Jeremy Singleton, and he stays in bounds inside the five. First and goal at the four for the Cougars. We mentioned all the differences in Dana's air raid. Here's one of the similarities. You see that mesh, these two routes that are going to cross right in the middle of your screen. 
get the eyes confused on the defense, slow their feet down a little bit, and give an athlete like Singleton room in space to make a play with the ball in his hands after the catch. This is a system that has a tendency to really make a quarterback look good. Still running simple plays, doesn't it? It, it does, and they said, and they pointed this out, because Derek King's a great athlete, but Clayton Toons, a guy more in the likeness and the mold of guys they've had success with in this offense in the past. Oh, but Carr makes it look easy, walks into the end zone, and the Cougars have a touchdown, and they've got the lead. Great job by the right guard, number 52, Braylon Jones, just keeping his knees in the defender. He keeps working. He has no time to reach off and make a play. And Carr able to find an easy lane to move up in. Mobakar, a refugee from the Civil War in Liberia. Eventually, he and his family made it to the United States. He became a U.S. citizen at age five. And now he's scoring touchdowns for the Cougars. They've got the lead. Something, something to ESPN, home of the college football playoff. Cougars have their first lead of the season, and it was a long wait to get here. With coronavirus postponing their first five games. Rice went away, Washington State went away, Memphis, Baylor, and North Texas all followed. It finally took them until tonight. Thursday night football, the 8th of October, the third consecutive season. They play a conference rival in Tulane. On Thursday night football, Bob Shoes and Mike Golick Jr. And Chris Budden bringing you ESPN College Football Primetime. And Dana Holgerson's team, after a 53-day training camp and five cancellations and a sloppy half, Finally here midway through the third quarter, they have their first lead of the season. They seem to have really calmed down and are starting to find themselves, avoiding the major blow on the muff punt and climbing back to take the lead in this football game. And Amari Jones will watch this one sail through the back of the end zone, Chris. Yeah, Bob, that Baylor cancellation was particularly frustrating for this Houston team because it happened 48 hours before kickoff was scheduled and some of the players found out via Twitter Holgerson called the team together talked to him through it and he said listen guys were pissed I had some guys crying I told them we're not going to practice this afternoon but the weight room's open so if you want to go take out your frustrations there half the team did got in a good sweat Holgerson meanwhile went back home sat by his pool and partook in a few beverages I know how he feels I can say, haven't we all been there? Maybe not in the receiving end of news quite like this, but at my house, we call that Wednesday. You're saying we wouldn't have found you in the weight room, Bob. <laughs> a penalty right out of the change of possession. And how about Tulane now? They've got a true freshman quarterback making his first ever start. They scored three touchdowns in the first half off turnovers, two directly scored by their defense. And now they've lost the lead. How do they respond? By eliminating pre-snap penalties like this, and this is managing the offense for a true freshman, something as simple as the cadence is so different from quarterback to quarterback, they've got to steady the ship. Screen pass. And they block it up. Barely getting back to the line of scrimmage is Stephon Hutterson, and it looks like he lost a yard. It'll be second down. Now check that. Looks like he... Probably picked up three and a half or four, so make it second down and 11. Got back most of that penalty yardage. And these backs as receivers out of the backfield. Remember, we saw plenty of this from Amari Jones, but Hutterson more than capable in his own right. Hutterson empties, empties the backfield. Deep ball thrown by Pratt. Right down the chimney. And that is good for a first down to Deuce Watts. And out in front of him, stacks the defensive back the entire way. And then what great concentration. You saw the arm of Damarian Williams, who's still a bit shaken up after the play, right in there on the ball. Still manages to hold through and maintain possession. And his full weight, it seemed like, came down right on the inside of that right leg of Williams. And he was shaken up. 
A terrific throw though by Michael Pratt. And Deuce Watts. You made an over the shoulder catch. It's a gain of 42 yards and exactly the kind of explosive play that Tulane needed. And you make life so easy on your quarterback as a receiver when you get this. You hear this all the time. Stack the defensive back. You get out in front of him. You see Pratt drop back here with pressure bearing down. But his receiver is so far out in front, he can put it out in front of him. He can run underneath it. It makes life so easy when you're not having to battle there. And he can go right over the top. An easy spot and an easy target for the quarterback to throw with. Again, pressure bearing down. So Demarion Williams, second on the team in tackles last season. And also a couple of interceptions. So that's a very important starting cornerback that's on the bench, at least right now. But good to see him able to walk it off and get to the sideline. So hopefully he'll be able to get back in the game. Play action for Pratt on first down. Right up the seam, and it would have been a walk-in touchdown for Tyrick James if he could have held on. And you see, this is a little air raid in its own right. That tight end slip out of the backfield that we see a coach like Lincoln Riley run so much of at Oklahoma there, taking advantage of him being in more of a blocking position, working his way through that trash with nothing but daylight in front of him. There was no one between Tyrick James and the end zone. Instead, it's second down and 10. Four-man rush. Pitch and catch, breaking tackles, and getting loose Amari Jones. He's got a first down, a gain of 12. And these are good rhythm plays for a young quarterback. They're getting back up to the line now, doing some of the things they had success with early. And more importantly, being able to keep personnel on the field, try and wear down this defense. Down the sideline again goes Pratt. Jump ball, broke it up. Flag out. Amari Jones again the intended receiver. Was he interfered with by Grant Stewart? Again, another situation where the defender's got his back turned, he's working into the receiver, and we saw plenty of celebrating from Grant Stewart there, the converted nickelback, but maybe a bit premature. Again, an ideal situation, one they've been taking advantage of with Pratt all night. Pass interference. Zero on the defense. 15 yard penalty. Automatic. First down. Again, he's a converted nickel, so he's no stranger to trying to cover these bodies, even with a few extra pounds. But it becomes the same problem you run into is if you're not turning, if you're face guarding and not facing the ball, all of a sudden the quarterback can just underthrow that, the receiver works back in, and you've got an easy spot of yellow for the offense. And now you can get back to doing what you want to do, hand it off down here, get some of these guards out on the move, and create some seams. Quarterback keeper on first and goal. A yard for Pratt. And there's a front side guard pull. They love to run down in this area, Bob, that we haven't seen yet tonight. Creates great open looks if you've got a tight end in line, but they seem content to spread it out here. Try and see if they can get some athletes in space. See if they'll go back to Tyrick James, number 80, who was open for an easy one before. Back right corner of the end zone, looking for the football is Jaquan Jackson, and he's got it for the touchdown. So Michael Pratt and Tulane answer right back. And the Green Wave retake the lead. And this just spotting a great matchup. Jaquan Jackson matched up with a safety, Javarius Owens, and fits it right in. Let's see if he maintained possession going to the ground. And it looks like he's got that football firmly wrapped up. And as long as it stayed on top of his body here, we see him turn over there for a second, but on top of his chest, good to go. How about that response by the Green Wave to retake the lead by three? Not too bad for a freshman quarterback.
Well, wherever the students are, the Taco Bell Live Moss Student Section lives. Visit livemossstudentsection.com to learn more as the student sections. Well, one of the things that makes college football the absolute best, and they are obviously not going to be what we have always known them to be in the past and certainly hopefully we'll have again in the future, but doesn't mean we don't recognize some of these great student sections doing the best they can to make some noise during college football in the age of coronavirus. Stevenson on the return. Getting loose. Breaking tackles. Staying alive. Marquez Stevenson with a convoy. Down the sideline. Touchdown. Has a flag been thrown? It looks like one has back up field. Two kickoff returns last season for Stevenson, second in the country with that kind of production. He is a game breaker on offense, a game breaker on special teams. We'll see if any of the blocking in the convoy that got him there might ultimately take this one back. And it's on two lane. This one's going to hang tight. And how about that for a little juice? We talked about Houston having a tough time. Nothing sparks a sideline quite like a special teams play because everybody on offense and everybody on defense gets a little extra time to rest. Boy, the rare penalty flag thrown against the coverage team in this situation. So the touchdown stands. Marquez Stevenson picking up right where he left off last year. Tied second best in America with a couple of kickoff return touchdowns last season. And he puts Houston back on top with a kickoff return touchdown of 97 yards. They call him Speedy for a reason. Thirty-five, thirty-one, Cougars. And we know Speedy's the name, but vision is what gets it done here. Working through contact, the cutback, and then the wherewithal to slow down. He sees the group in front of him, and he stays right alongside that cavalry of red jerseys and understand that's his ticket to the promised land. So Speed gets the party started here, but it's the vision in the field that comes with being a veteran returner that gets it done. Cougars, one of the best in America in all areas of special teams. And behind the play, you can see that altercation right there is what drew the flag. I believe the flag ultimately went for a face mask, and you can see the two-lane defender that just got, we call that burping him on that play. Get him on the ground, and you get him burp. All of a sudden, responded with the face mask. So some wild swings in this game right now. A great response drive by Tulane met with a quick answer five and a half minutes still remaining in the third quarter and it's 35 31 Houston all the all-state good hands field goal net program continues for every field goal and extra point kicked this season by participating universities all-state will make a contribution to the university's general scholarship fund. We thank Allstate. Can Tulane respond again? A moment ago, Michael Pratt led a touchdown drive that gave Tulane the lead, and now he'll have to do it again. Pratt dialed in on the sideline, counting him up. But that's an involved quarterback. <laughs> He's out there. And he notices that they're down a guy. We've only got 10 on the field. And he's right. 
And they go through the back of the end zone for a touchback, but Tulane only had 10 players on the field on kickoff return. And the true freshman quarterback realized it. And we've seen him dialed in like this in the second half. A great shot downfield to Deuce Watts on that play. But it's the ability to take what's there to get his playmakers the ball. Amari Jones with a great short look and then recognizing a mismatch in coverage. You've got Jaquan Jackson matched up with a safety on that corner and he puts the ball whizzing it right past the defender for a great touchdown. He has looked poised and responded even after a penalty to start that last drive. Low throw here and it's incomplete. Let's check in with Chris. You, you guys notice him dialed in. He is like that on the sidelines non-stop. The coaching staff told us he's got swag. It oozes out of him. I am telling you, he does not even sit down. He paces the sidelines, constantly talking to his teammates. After that last Houston touchdown, he said, no big deal, we're just gonna go score. There you go. I mean, you need that kind of a strut in your quarterback, right? As it's second down and 10. And he'll hand one off to Hutterson. Two and a half yards. It'll be third down and a long seven, close to eight. I, I got to tell you, this makes my very still, at its core, overweight heart sing. Watching Amari Jones, we saw him as a pass catcher. We've seen him in the backfield, mixing it up last play as a lead blocker going through the middle out of that two-back formation. He can do so much when he's on the field for you, and it's allowed him as a chess piece for them to move the tempo on offense because he can line up a receiver, he can line up as a back, and you don't have to change personnel to do that. Three-man rush on third down and eight. Pratt steps up in the pocket and nowhere to go. Dragged down near the line of scrimmage by DeAnthony Jones. DeAnthony Jones backing off into coverage on this play. You see him popping off in the middle of the field, keeping his eye on the quarterback, and then putting his foot in the ground and coming downhill. Go on, big fella. Marcus Jones in a bit of an adventure on punt return tonight but he gets a block another good return for Houston out to their 41 yard line they will have very good field position and this week electrifying quarterbacks highlight our Saturday night primetime game De'Ara King and number seven Miami take on Trevor Lawrence and number one Clemson 730 Eastern 430 Pacific on ABC and the ESPN app this just in, Bob, these guys are really good at football. Derek King, who everyone here at Houston familiar with watching change the face of games. But Trevor Lawrence looks like unquestionably the best player in college football. Excited to see him get a test against what's always going to be a very savvy, very active Manny Diaz coach Miami defense. Quarterback keeper. Boy, we have seen the quarterbacks do terrific work Faking with the football, and Clayton Toon with a great fake of his own and a run for 18. And you see the exchange on the back side going down underneath that linebacker outside, but great recognition by 64, Dennis Bardwell, seeing that linebacker flow back, getting just enough of a piece of him after the great read by the quarterback. Toon does it again. This time dives forward for four. And Bob, you'll see a lot of defenses do this on the backside of read option plays. Patrick Johnson, number seven, the end comes crashing down, and that linebacker will fill the space in that outside gap. That offensive line adjusted the last couple of plays, got just enough of the linebacker to get positive yardage. Four yards on first down is a win every single time. Wide open, Mulbacar. Nice one-on-one -on -one tackle, though. Pulled down by Willie Langham. And he gets up with a limp. And it looks like Mulbacar is going to take himself out. Full line change here now for this Houston offense. Third and manageable here. We've seen them go to a slot a fair amount on these plays here. Bryson Smith, number one, lined up in there now. 
Timeout call. That came from Dana Holgerson on the sideline. So that's the first timeout called by the Cougars with two and a half to go in the third. Again, this game taking place in Houston, but Houston all the way to New Orleans could potentially be impacted in the coming couple of days by yet another tropical system. Hurricane Delta making its way towards western Louisiana. And it has just been a highway, a train of tropical systems that has affected the Gulf Coast throughout this entire hurricane season. You continue to think and pray about everyone's safety first and foremost. Everyone who's got families in the area wanting to know that they're going to be safe and sound. After the timeout, catch made by Christian Trahan, the tight end. And there's no thought process here, and I love it. Let's keep your foot on the gas and go for it. They know it's going to take points to win this game. They saw that response from Tulane. Big get opportunity up. here for the Tulane defense, though, if they can get a stop on fourth and two. You see it loaded up. Your wideouts are going to have a one-on-one -on -one shot. Toon on the slant, broken up. Bryson Smith, the intended receiver. Did he hold on to the football? I guess, hey, he managed to stick with that grab. Again, one-on-one -on -one here with a safety. Larry Brooks on the back end. That is great coverage, and somehow Bryson Smith able to take that one in. What a catch. Fourth down conversion keeps the drive alive for Houston. Toon extending the play. Down the sideline, at the goal line, this one is hauled in, and it is a touchdown. Nathaniel Dell, they call him Tank, and he is able to find the end zone for a Houston score. Make sure he's able to maintain possession all the way to the ground as he just keeps working here, and a great job by Toon. Three-man rush, by time, get it to your receiver downfield. Now we'll have to wait and see from that other angle if he's able to hold on to that ball all the way through, landing on the other side. And did he get into the end zone before he was down? It looks like he is on the goal line before his knee touches. It used to be, with replays of catches, all you were looking for is maybe if the ball hit the ground, but it is an adjustment to the rule where they've clarified that the ball can touch the ground if, in the judgment of the officials, the receiver has complete control of the ball when it touches the ground. And, and it, this looks like a ball that Dell controls all the way to the ground. And I think in this instance, call the touchdown on the field. There's not going to be enough from any angle we've seen to overturn that right now. He gets that second hand underneath. So they're not only looking to see if indeed Tank Dell did control the ball all the way through the catch, but also if perhaps his knee was down and before it looks, he broke the plane, and that freeze frame actually makes it look like the ball may end up on the half-yard line. Great freeze by our camera crew right there. As again, we said as he goes to the ground, we saw no angle that indicated he lost possession, but that knee clearly down there. This one probably going to get spotted at the half-yard line. Give them a chance to pound it in here, maybe get back to that diamond set we saw earlier. Or is this a spot where if you tank Dell, you get maybe within earshot of Dana Holgerson. You're like, coach, fade, corner fade. <laughs> Don't you do this to me again, right? Bob. When you're taken down at the half yard line. <laughs> I understand the plight of our wide receiver brethren. <laughs> but this is pound the rock territory. First and goal, quarterback sneak. The push for Clayton Toon. They scored a touchdown earlier in the game on quarterback sneak. This time, Toon comes up about a half-yard shot. And you see the concerted effort by Tulane defensively. 
they see what's coming, they understand what's coming. Line up in that same formation, get it out, hand it off to one of your guys. You've got a walk-in somewhere waiting for you on the edge with all the focus under center at the quarterback spot. And they will give it to one of the running backs. That's Kyle Porter, and he dives in for the touchdown. And we had seen that formation a couple of times there, Bob. Better job on the exchange. Gets just enough of them, and then you know on the inside, it's just elbows and a word I can't say on TV. And you dive right over the top of that mass of humanity and find your way in. It is cable. You know what? It's like, <laughs> I've, I've heard this, my dad told me this day one, you could say anything once. Right. If you'd like this to be your last game, feel free. I'm having too much fun with you, Bob. I don't want that. <laughs> Good. 42-31. Houston, they gave away 21 points in the first quarter when their offense turned it over. But Clayton Toon has responded. Talk about having amnesia, right? You throw the pick six to start. You give up a scoop and score on a sack where you don't protect the ball. And all of a sudden, you're down two touchdowns. Well, he has responded 279 yards. And he's got three total scores after the two early giveaways. We saw him make use of his legs on that last drive, too. Make the defense have to think about a little bit of everything. But now that they've cleaned up those errors, those mental mistakes, that come with this being your first football game. They settled in in that halftime locker room and remind ourselves, guys, look what we're capable of in that first half as long as we just do the little things right. Well, Michael Pratt's down by two scores. Now he's got a smile on his face. You wonder if that sometimes might not be a quarterback's best friend because at some point now, if you're a QB down by a couple of scores, you start looking at the play caller going, you know, you're going to have to let me throw it and throw it a lot. And this is the beauty of where they're at, though, right now. 11 points in an entire quarter as that ball comes off the tee, and they'll re-tee that up. You've still got everything in your offensive repertoire right now. Your running backs have done a tremendous job as pass catchers for you. All of that is still in play to mimic a running game in the short area with passes. You don't have to expose your quarterback too much too soon. It'll be a touchback as Jones lets that one sail into the end zone. It really is impressive to see, though, Bob, a true freshman. I played with a redshirt freshman by the name of Everett Golson on a, my last season at Notre Dame. We end up going undefeated, and I was always amazed at his demeanor on the sideline for a guy that hadn't played high-level football like that before that year to have that come and that permeates through the group so seeing the way he addresses his teammates on the sideline it's such a boost for everyone else to feel more comfortable not having to play outside yourself and they will go wildcat and take Michael Pratt split him out and then run a trick play and he's gonna have to throw this one away Houston was not at all fooled by the double reverse and the flea flicker and a wise play by Michael Pratt Trick play not working, don't force it. Live to fight another day. And great discipline by the defense. Seeing and understanding 44. De'Anthony Jones again showing up. But a great job making the next step. Michael Pratt, who took a bad sack earlier in this game, getting rid of this one. Live to fight another down. Although that last replay made it look like Amari Jones was wide open down the sideline. But the pressure coming in Pratt didn't have time to see him. And here comes some more pressure. And down he goes. Derek Parrish gets the sack. And this is important to remember, starting left tackle, Joey Claybrook out on this one. So you've got a backup here at left tackle. Getting beat clean by an experienced guy, Derek Parrish. Gets beat clean off the edge. Great hands by 31 in red. As a backup, getting a lot more action than he bargained for going into a game tonight. Joey Claybrook, an experienced player for them at left tackle, one of their best. And Tulane is not going to get a snap off before the end of the third quarter. So we head to the fourth with Houston. Down big early, but a response by the Cougars. Paul Bacar with a touchdown. Speedy Stevenson, 97 yards on a kickoff return. Big plays for the Cougars. 
and an 11 point lead. Ball primetime, Bob Oshusa, Mike Golick Jr., Chris Budden heading to the fourth quarter. It's a shootout between Houston and Tulane. And we start the fourth with Tulane down by a couple of scores. Michael Pratt, he's going to take a shot. Trying for the deep ball again. The adjustment by Michael Jones. And it's incomplete. And a great job on both counts here. Art Green in coverage. Hand fighting at the top of this route. Looking back for the ball. Hits him right in the stomach. I love the no call there by the officials. Yeah, he hadn't turned around. But both of them working for the football at the top of that one. Punt to start the fourth quarter as Ryan Wright sends it all the way down inside the 25-yard line. Room to run, though, for Marcus Jones. He gets a couple of blocks, and he's across the 50 before he's finally bumped out of bounds. Boy, the return game has been a big factor for Houston, and we'll see what the big-time quarterbacks have in store in our Saturday night primetime game. Trevor Lawrence and De'Ara King square off. Number one meets number seven. Clemson and Miami at 7.30 Eastern, 4.30 Pacific on ABC and the ESPN app. And boy, what more can Trevor Lawrence do? He's so impressive. And in this day and age where Patrick Mahomes has really spoiled all of us with what he can do on the football field, Trevor has some of those off-platform, running away, back across your body, mass massive arm strength kind of throws in his bag. Handler Smith for a couple of yards. And you know, for this Clemson team, they're looking to replace a lot of talent at wide receiver. T. Higgins goes to the NFL. Justin Ross lost for the year due to surgery. Amari Rogers has stepped up in a big way for them, made some big time plays, some great one handed grabs. They're going to need more consistent production there, though, as they start to take a step up in competition like this against a team like Miami. Tune. He wants a deep shot for the end zone to Speedy Stevenson for the touchdown. Two years ago, Speedy Stevenson, first team, All-American Conference. Last year, first team, All-American Conference. Based on his performance tonight, I think he's on his way to a first team All-Conference selection. Again, he is a game-changing player. And Clayton Toon's done such a great job all night. When he sees his receivers with favorable matchups against Tulane safeties, there's no question where that ball's going in his mind. And you're going to see another example of it right here for Stevenson. His eyes light up. You see Stevenson, number five, here right in the slot. The quarterback understands he's got a safety matched up against him. That's Larry Brooks, number 31, right there. And as soon as he sees that snap, that ball's going towards the middle of the field. Defender flips his hip, and that is game time. Well, we asked Clayton Toon, what's your favorite route to throw? I love throwing the deep post to number five. There's a quarterback's favorite throw to his favorite target. He said, I just throw it as far as I can, and number five runs under it. And I love to see a good bit of dancing in college football. Quarterback celebrating with the big boys. I always felt bad. Skill position players start running away when the good things happen. Quarterback understands Jack Freeman's not moving too far, too fast. I'm going to go celebrate with the guys that got me that. But how about the night for Stevenson? 118 yards receiving, a 97-yard kick return touchdown. He is every bit as advertised from last season, leading the charge for an experienced receiving group that, again, Dana Holgerson. Dana Holgerson, who coached some of those great Mountaineer teams, some of those great Houston teams in the past as an offensive coordinator, said is his fastest receiving core he's ever coached. And Clayton Toon hasn't missed in the second half. He is 8 for 8. The latest, the touchdown pass to Stevenson. Amari Jones brings it out. He's got a good return. Across the 35-yard line for Tulane before he's bumped out. Oh, well, now this must, at least in some way, take Michael Pratt and Tulane 
out of their desired game plan. You still want, I'm sure, to mix the run in somewhat, but now you're down three scores to a team that certainly seems like your defense can't stop. Does this make them play one-handed? Oh, yeah, you got to go out and get after it now. And so I expect to see Amari Jones a lot more in the slot. Expect Deuce Watts then to look his way early and often if he's got one-on-one -on -one matchups on the outside. They need chunk plays. Pratt Lasso down on the sack by Peyton Turner. Again, back up in at left tackle. And so you've got 98 Peyton Turner on him. And he just goes right around him. A great hand chop on that outside arm against a guy who, again, is subbing in for number 79. Joey Claybrook went off with an injury earlier. Claybrook had become one of the best offensive linemen in the conference. And now they've gone in and keyed and put their best rusher on his backup. Slant. And that's coughed up by Fat Watts. Will that be ruled a completion and a fumble? It is not. They'll say incomplete. So it's third and 17. If you're receiver, you not only have to catch the ball and get two feet down, but you have to put it away and make a move common to the game, some kind of a football move, so you become a runner. And in the official's judgment there, he had not made that football move. As soon as the second foot hit, the ball popped out. So third and 17. Four-man rush. Screen pass, hurried, and Hutterson couldn't hold on. And now it's fourth and 17. And now this is a drive where you really have a chance to put it away if you're Houston. Already up 18, your defense is able to hold them there and really get after them with four rushers. We talked about that as such a key for Tulane. Houston's defense, led by Peyton Turner up front especially. Derek Parrish with the sack earlier in the game, leading a charge for their four-man rush. Marcus Jones. Lost the football. And who's got it? Tulane. Just the break that Tulane needed. A turnover as Marcus Jones has it stripped right out of his hands. And I think it may have been stripped out by his own man. This was absolutely one of his own blockers here. You'll see him field it cleanly, but now one of his own players trying to get involved and make a play, make a block on that. And we saw this earlier, a fumble for Stevenson on the offensive side where it hits off his own leg. And here he's trying to cut back. That ball held just a little too loose in all of that clutter. This is the only thing that's kept Tulane in the game all night. Got a chance to go right for the end zone here on the very first play. Rat on the run, flag down, and he throws it away. Should be a holding right here, bringing this one back. After the play, foul, Jerry Ruffin. Defense, 15 yard penalty, and automatic. And just a backbreaker for Houston defensively after a great play. Look at right here, Grant Stewart, zero for Houston. Reading the screen the entire way, seeing Cameron Carroll coming out of the backfield, getting right in line with him. That whole defense rallies to the ball. You get the hold. But then on the back end of that, to give them an easy first down, inexcusable. 
Well, I'm not sure if that little bump on the quarterback was the penalty that they got. If it was, that was an awfully soft personal foul. Unless it was elsewhere on the play, something we couldn't see, but it does give Tulane a first down. Now they come up empty on first down, so it's second down and 10 with 12 and a half to go. And grinding out two or three yards on the ground. It'll be third down and about eight as Cameron Carroll picked up a couple. We've talked so much about the analytics in these situations, understanding before the drive, Will Hall, their offensive coordinator, what he's got to work with. Down 18, you know you're in four down territory from here on out. 12 minutes is plenty of time, but you still got to go. Long throw to the sideline, back shoulder missed time for Michael Jones. And now it's fourth down and eight in plus territory. You're probably compelled to go for it with 11.48 to go in the game, down by three scores. Absolutely, and just understanding the clip that Houston's been scoring at again, outside of turnovers, this Houston offense has been automatic in the second half, so you've got to continue to go for it here. Deuce Watts has been money for you all night. I'd look two's way. 11 also on the field in the slot. Great matchup if you've got that linebacker, and we see Grant Stewart out over him right now. Could be a great spot. Kicking a field goal here would cut the lead to 15, but they will go for it. And they'll pay the price as Pratt goes down. It's another sack for what has been a terrific night for the defensive line for Houston. As Torres Payne is able to bring down Pratt. And it's a turnover on downs. ESPN College Football is presented by Capital One. What's in your wallet? A Houston legend, Bill Yeoman, passed away this summer at 92 years of age. And talk about leaving behind a legacy. Talk about impacting the game. The inventor of the Veer offense. To say that you invented an offensive system that then permeated so many different offensive systems around the world of football as his old team goes back to work with 11 and a half minutes to go and a three-score lead. And, and to honor and celebrate him, you saw pictures and the cutouts of him. What a cool feature through college football. I've seen some great stories about cutoffs and the big stories behind them, the cutout there. But to honor a legend like that at your school on, again, a, a, an opening day for Houston football that's been so long in the making, a very fitting time to honor and tribute for a legend. Diamond formation on second down and seven. And off to Keelan Walker. And that is good for a first down. Now, I love watching Dana Holgerson on the sideline, much like Mike Leach. Now, you see, especially NFL coaches, with these monstrous laminated 5,000 play game plans. And you see Dana Holgerson, there it is. See it in his left hand? That's the game plan. Mike Leach will have like an index card, and he'll just give a number. And that number is the system play, and that's it. The quarterback knows it, and it just could not be simpler and obviously could not be more effective. They always talk about the air raid, that three-day air raid install. And we know Mike Leach, who had so much success against the defending national champions in week one for them in the SEC, in large part because even with an abbreviated offseason, you're a new head coach there. It is an offense that's very easy to install now. Mike Leach's version that doesn't feature a lot of running, that is very boom or bust like that. We saw the very next week how it can go the opposite direction quickly. But to get off the ground, it's an offense that you can definitely get in place, especially when you've got great athletes like they've got here at Houston, certainly like they've got at Mississippi. State. And the Cougars with the play clock at five, second down and seven. And it's another bully first down right up the middle for Keelan Walker. And these are the moments you crave as a guy up front. We've highlighted Braylon Jones, number 52, their right guard a couple of times tonight. But him, Jack Freeman, these guys working overtime because now they know you've got the chance to put a game away. And a quote from the great Joe Moore, one of the greatest offensive line coaches of all time, no greater feeling than moving a man from point A to point B against his will. Mm. 
and around. Speedy Stevenson gets a block. A little high step to the outside with flags everywhere. Tight end Christian Trahan that will be called for a hold out on the edge. You're going to see right out here starting to play 85, and this is working off that counter action. So you've got everyone going one way, trying to get it back across there, but big guy in space, and I. That's another one. It looks like he got his hands off in time. That's a bit of a suspect hold from my angle. Cut back run for Terrell Brown. And he thought he was going to break a tackle and get a lot more than he did. You know, when an offensive line really works in concert with one another, it's fun talking to the offensive line coach. Right? Who was the best offensive line coach you ever had? And what impact did a really good offensive line coach have on you and that unit as a whole? Harry Heastan was my offensive line coach my last year at Notre Dame. Obviously birthed a ton of All-Americans there. When you think of Ronnie Stanley, Mike McGlinchey, Quinton Nelson, the guys that are stars on Sunday now. And it was that consistent dedication to a standard in the room. Just off the fingertips of Keith Corbin on a deep shot. It'll be third and long. But understanding what was expected of you, the attention to detail up front every day, because you're right, when five guys see the game through one set of eyes, you can make pretty amazing things up happen. That level of cohesiveness, spending so much time together, watching so much film together, really being the point of the spear, a group that your team can rely on, that all starts with the tone set by a coach. And Coach Eastan is one of the absolute best men I've ever been around, but certainly his attention to detail and the standard he held that room to makes such a huge difference. Up the middle on third and long goes Walker. And that will take us under eight minutes to go. And it will be a punt for the Cougars. And when you watch on tape a really good offensive line, it's amazing the synchronicity with which the group moves. Right? Footwork. Like everyone's first step is the same. Everyone's second step is the same. And it's really the only unit in this sport that all has to move in exact synchronicity for it to really be effective. I always give defensive backs credit. They're small offensive linemen in my book because it's another group that relies so much on each other and performs one of the most unnatural skill sets. Both have to go backwards against some of the best athletes in the world and try and use enough technique to maintain. Houston will take the delay. Let me also add, as the one half of the broadcast team here, that normally I'm here with Dan Orlovsky, a skinny, full head of hair, perfectly quaffed quarterback. It's amazing. I really feel much more at home with this pairing, I have to say. Like, you're my people. Oh, listen. You know what I mean? Bald, the waistline, not necessarily. <laughs> this booth has You're its the hand. number one bullet point. <laughs> <laughs> this booth has its hand firmly planted in the dirt. There is no <laughs> doubt right. about it. We are a phone booth booth. <laughs> Amari Jones with the fair catch. Midway through the fourth, Tulane has the football back. Top two, each battling in prime time. Saturday at 7.30 on ABC and ESPN. Number one and number two in primetime on ABC and ESPN on Saturday night. And since the start of 2015, our expert analysis when we saw this graphic, Mike Golick Jr., earlier tonight was that Clemson is good. What if I told you that we seem to be on track yet again for another Clemson and Alabama national championship? Also, water is wet and both of us are hungry. <laughs> Things that surprise absolutely Alabama 
hell of a start to their season. Matt Jones picking up very well for Tua Tungavailoa, who's now waiting for his turn in the Miami Dolphins. We've talked so much about the air raid tonight. It is fully on display in the SEC now as well, and that's not just Lane Kiffin and Mike Leach. Deuce Watts picks up a first down. It's odd to me as well that so many would wonder, oh, Tua, he leaves Alabama. What kind of an impact is that going to have? Well, go back through all of the great teams that Nick Saban has had at Alabama, national championship-level teams, as Pratt takes a shot downfield, underthrown a bit, and incomplete intended for Jacob Robertson. Before Tua, they never had a lottery pick quarterback. I mean, normally they were winning with their run game, with tremendous defense, with awesome offensive linemen. They have all of that. Najee Harris got five touchdowns already. Jalen Waddle's got three touchdowns as well. But they never needed the top of the first round star quarterback to win. That that was almost a, a new thing, having a, a Tua Tunga Bailoa there that, that performed at that level at that position. Nick Saban saw for so long the only thing that really ever had a chance at beating them, mobile quarterbacks that could make extra effort plays. Think Johnny Manziel's, think some of those old, old Miss teams. And so he said, all right, fine, I'll get one of those too, because you're right, it used to be A.J. McCarron, our great colleague Greg McElroy, yep. who were great guys in that role. But now you've got playmakers and at those offensive skill positions, and they've built it up in that way in such a short amount of time and show no signs of ever going back. Stephon Hutterson picks up the first down for Tulane, but they need to hurry. This has to be on the gas pedal right now for the Green Wave, down by three scores with six minutes to go. Rolling it the line today. The previous play is under further review. Well, it looked as if they had given Hutterson the first down. Now they spot the football, and it looks like they're about a foot short. Will it be fourth down? They'll check when we come back. Our spotlight brought to you by Taco Bell takes us to this trio. The skill position players have stepped it up tonight for Houston. And that's ignoring Marquez Stevenson. Speedy's 98-yard kickoff return for a touchdown in this one as well. The Stars as advertised. Well, they confirmed the ruling on the field. That that was indeed a fourth down forced by the Houston defense. And now going for it on the sneak is Michael Pratt on fourth down at about a half yard. And it looks as if the officials will mark him short. And it is indeed a takeaway on downs for the Houston defense with 6.04 to go. So unable to pick up about a half yard on fourth down. Michael Pratt on the quarterback sneak and controlling the line of scrimmage, the interior of that Houston defensive front. And a great surge up front by them. You saw Pratt tried to run up to the line at that last second, see if he could catch them off guard, but that D-line ready to go in and submarine. More elbows on the word I can't say. You get the idea, but that is, that is what they're taught in those situations. Go down, crab out, try and get the quarterback's feet out from under him. Well, Tulane will be heading home, and Chris Budden, they'll be getting home past curfew, it looks like. They will. In fact, they're getting dangerously close to missing it right now. 10.30 is their curfew every single night. Really, Fritz put this in place as the protocols for this season to help keep his team safe. And 10.30 for a college kid. Mike, you're the one closest to all of us as to being in college. That is really early for a college kid. But in New Orleans, that's like dinner time. Yeah, Chris, that's a little easier to sell in South Bend, Indiana, New Orleans. The restraint and the commitment by these athletes is remarkable. Having spent some time down there briefly in the offseason with the New Orleans Saints, I can tell you I sampled almost every restaurant down there. I can tell you where to get the best beignets, and I can probably help you find the 15 pounds I picked up down there, too. My first night in New Orleans on Bourbon Street. The Hurricanes showed up. And it all went downhill from there. It, you, <laughs> usually how it goes. You and a long list of the rest of us, That's Bob. Right. Great company. Leighton Toon towards the end zone. Keith Corbin laying out. He couldn't haul it in. I remember doing 
Temple basketball back in the days of John Chaney. And he used to have his team's practice, I think, at 6, 6.30 in the morning. And I used to say, well, 6 or 6.30 in the morning? Why would you do that? So, well, when you practice at 6, 6.30 in the morning, at 10 o'clock, you know right where your players are. As someone who worked for the last three years on a morning radio show, really the last five, I can attest to that. Yes. It is a hell of a deterrent. Tulane shows blitz. And now Toon changing things up. Three on the play clock. Third down and five. They barely get the snap off. And getting hit right at the line of scrimmage. Dorian Williams is able to bury Terrell Brown and force a fourth down. Let's see what Houston does with five minutes to go in plus territory on fourth down. I'll send out the field goal unit, it looks like. And you knew Dana Holgerson wasn't going to be able to resist taking that shot that he did on the play before, but this Houston offense for really the last four minutes has been in what you always term when you're installing it, four-minute offense, grinding out the clock, trying to milk it, bleed it down here when you've got a lead like this, go out there and lean on these guys. And it does not look like Houston has enough personnel on the field. They may only have 10 in the formation. They were trying to beat the play clock, but they're going to call a timeout now. That also might be the rust of not playing five games to start the season. This is the beginning of your year. You know, so many times in NFL preseason, you see fire drills sometimes on special teams, running players on and off. You don't have preseason football in college football. You go right from your spring game to summer practice to regular season football, and you see some of these substitution mistakes, especially in your first game. And I tell you, there's nothing more dangerous than a coach coming off of a win with things like that to correct because they know, all right, we got out of this. We're coming out of it 1-0. and But they take every opportunity they can to lean in as we see the missed kick there on the extra point. So Dalton Witherspoon misses a chance to add three more. I think she's happy with an 18-point lead. <laughs> Get after it. Work. Sports Center, standing by. John Anderson, Michael Eves will talk to Trevor Maddich about how Miami could pull off a Clemson upset. We'll see. Plus, live postgame coverage of Bucks Bears and a breakdown of the four MLB division series in action. The Yankees find a way to force a game five with the Rays. Sports Center, after college football next here on ESPN and the ESPN app. Bob Shoes and Mike Golick Jr. And Chris Budden bringing you Thursday night primetime college football. Tulane and Houston here in the American. And early in the game, Tulane, three takeaways in the first quarter. Five overall. And yet they're down by three scores with four minutes to go. Michael Pratt squeezes one through. And that looks to be good enough for a first down as Christian Daniels has the catch. Great hands catch by Christian Daniels, too. The converted quarterback guy is a heck of an athlete, still really learning the position, but they think could have a bright future there. And, and these reps all still matter. You've got a young, true freshman quarterback. You've got an offense that you're continuing to try and grow and develop. All these are important shots at your two-minute offense. Pratt tripped up but maintains his balance and picks up a first down. Ridden down by David Anini but not before he moves the chains with three and a half minutes to go. And listen, I shouldn't rule anything out. I've watched Big 12 football this year. We've seen crazy comebacks. I was there for Texas and Texas Tech. And when I say there, I mean in my living room watching like most everybody else in the country. Anything is possible, though we know it unlikely as we sit here. Out of the pocket again is Pratt. Heaves one downfield, had a wide open. Christian Daniels and missed him. And he gets up with a limp. And they moved Jalen Miller, who had been switching over at right tackle into that left tackle spot for the injured Joey Claybrook, able to hold on a little bit longer against Derek Parrish as we get the heave downfield. And that hit wide open there, but just a great job of staying with the rush by Derek Parrish, getting just enough to make the throw uncomfortable for Pratt.
Right up the middle. Running room for Cameron Carroll. You know, Tulane, with that gain, only has 218 yards of total offense. So don't let the 31 points fool you. They got two defensive scores and a short field for their third score with another Houston giveaway. Five Cougars turnovers. This, without those five Houston turnovers, this game would be far more lopsided than it even is, and it's a three-score lead. Yeah, pretty incredible when you think about it. They sit with 80 yards rushing right now. They've got a streak of 56 consecutive games with 100 yards rushing. Does Tulane. That's the kind of production they're used to around here, and that's the kind of off night it's been for this offense. Pratt with the pocket collapsing again. They just can't protect as Peyton Turner gets through for another Houston sack. And we mentioned it, you move a guy in Jalen Miller, number 61, who's used to rotating in at that right tackle spot with the true freshman, Trey Tuggle. Now he's switching completely to the left side, and there's a lot of places to cross train, but that's a difficult spot to flip in the middle of a game when you're not prepared to, and you probably haven't practiced there as much during the week. And so a guy like Peyton Turner, who is already expected to be one of the better rushers on this team, has been having a lot of success. Really, this entire Houston D-line has on that left side. Incomplete on second and 14, but a flag is out. Giovanni Stewart, the linebacker, in coverage. They've gotten there a bit early. Pass interference, number nine, defense. That's a grad transfer from West Virginia who spent three years under Dana Holgerson playing in Morgantown. And he had wrapped up the tight end, Christian Daniels. And again, you got to do your best as a coach to treat this as a situation. Minute 30 left, three timeouts. You want your young quarterback going out here and taking command of this offense, using the snap count like that. So the true freshman, Shadozi Nuwankwo, jumps in the neutral zone. Listed at 5'11". We call that a low center of gravity. That's a tough <laughs> man to move. Low man wins. Always. Back shoulder throw. Broken up. Deuce watch the intended receiver. Incredible job staying with it. Watch the left arm of number 25, DJ Small here, coming up at the end of the play, punching that football out on Deuce Watts. Deuce Watts with a couple of great contested catches tonight, really going up and get it. They were looking for guys to emerge in this receiving core. He's one I think has a pretty bright future. Five-man rush. That goes right through the hands of Hutterson. So it will be third down and five. What has Michael Pratt shown you tonight? I think a lot of poise and the ability to turn the page after early mistakes. We saw trouble operating the offense, getting guys up, aligned, and set in the right time. A couple of false start penalties. That sack that set them up for second and 21, I think back in the second quarter, that really stalled the drive at a critical juncture. And since then, he's played more within himself. He's avoided a lot of those big mistakes and made some of the throws that are there, took some good shots downfield. And he takes another sack here. Six sacks on the night for Houston as they bring a blitz on third down, and it will be fourth down. Manny Nunnery, you're going to want to watch number 14 in the middle of this defense here, and just great timing. We had seen them getting beat on so many four-man rushes, and so Sincere Hayworth, the center, Haynesworth, excuse me, bailing out, trying to help one of his guys, and 14 times that rush downhill perfect. So under a minute to go, one more chance for Pratt on fourth down and 12.
And he'll simply heave this one down the sideline out of bounds. It'll be victory formation for Houston. They gave it away five times and had to wait 53 days of camp to play their first game of the season, but they will begin with a win tonight. How about our Saturday slate? What cheat games jump out at you on what really is wall-to-wall -wall starting at noon with two ranked versus ranked games all the way up to number one and number two, both playing in prime time. Yeah, I think obviously we've talked about Clemson and Miami, just an unbelievable conference matchup in the ACC. But Kyle Trask and this Florida offense have been monsters in the early going of this season. Texas A&M licking their wounds after last week and get the reward of getting to play a Gators offense that's got one of the best connections in the country with him and his tight end pits. And one more chance to carry the football. As Houston will give one to James Fulbright. And that should be, I would think, the final play of the game. So it was a rusty start as expected for the Cougars. Five giveaways, allowing two Tulane defensive scores early. And yet once they shook the rust off, it was a pretty dominant performance from that point out. They always call it hidden yardage. Special teams stepped up big for them tonight. Marcus Jones, their punt returner. Stevenson is a kick returner. And this team, imagine what they can accomplish, the coaches will say, if we take better care of the football. Sky's the limit right now. Well, Speedy Stevenson put on a show, and Dana Holgerson's team gets a 49-31 win in their opener. For Mike Golick Jr. and Chris Budden and our entire ESPN crew, I'm Bob Wischusen. Thanks so much for watching. Michael Eaves, John Anderson, they are standing by. It's time for SportsCenter.